Your Honor, calling people versus James Crumbly, case number 22 279 FH. Thank you, Marquise. On behalf of the people. Karen McDonald, on behalf of the people. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Marielle Lehman, on behalf of James Crumbly. Who is the next witness? Uh, Special Agent Brett Brandon, Judge. All right, you ready for the jury? May we approach briefly, Your Honor? Thank you. Microphone.
I'm covering up your charitable organization shirt. Do, do you want to be excluded from the courtroom? Do you want to be excluded from the courtroom? No, not especially. Okay. Are you ready for the jury? People ready. in charge of this case. Okay, and what does that mean? Uh, it means that I've been uh, assigned with Lieutenant Willis to uh, usher this investigation through the uh, prosecution. Okay. This, this Lieutenant Willis? Yes. Okay. He's normally sitting right here. He's also an officer in charge? Yes. Okay. And can you tell the jury what your occupation is? Yes, I'm a special agent with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. Uh, it's commonly referred to as just ATF. And what does the ATF do? Uh, the ATF enforces uh, uh, the nation's uh, firearms, arson, and explosive laws. Obviously, we, we primarily focus on the firearms laws. And so you're employed by the state or the federal government? The federal government. Okay. As part of that, well, I'm sorry, let me get to this. A little bit about your um, experience and background um, that brings you here to testify. How long have you been a special agent? How long have you been with the ATF? Uh, it'll be 15 years in July. Okay, how long have you been a special agent? I've uh, been a special agent for, it'll be approaching 11 years in July. And what, what does special agent mean? A special agent, so if, it means we're a criminal investigator trained in investigating for the purposes of ATF, the crimes underneath the jurisdiction of ATF, but also we assist with other federal investigations and obviously state and local investigations uh, for ATF primarily involving the use of firearms. And what is your educational background? Uh, I have a degree from Oakland University uh, with, in political science. Uh, I spent one year at, uh, at law school at the Catholic University of America, and then obviously I was, I was trained uh, at the ATF National Academy for the requisite training to become an ATF agent. Is part of your role in the, the ATF based, you, 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 you're based in Michigan, in Michigan? Yes. Okay. Do you have um, any interaction with state investigations, and if so, what are they? Yes, I've had many throughout my career. Right now I'm assigned to the Pontiac Gun Violence Task Force. It's a partnership between the Oakland County Sheriff's Office and the ATF. Um, in that uh, role, um, we investigate both state and federal firearms violations occurring within the city of Pontiac, mm -hmm. primarily uh, shootings. And do you ever respond to or have anything to do with investigations that don't involve shootings? Yes. What kind of? Uh, so generally, uh, for whether it's the task force or just a, as, a, as a, an ATF agent, uh, it's primarily the criminal possession and use of firearms. So in other words, it doesn't have to be a shooting, it could just be a possession of sure, firearms? Sure, yeah. okay. yes. About how many uh, shooting investigations have you been a part of? Oh, uh, hundreds at this point in my career. And do you, as a part of in your role, have a general understanding of um, the laws associated with purchasing firearms, both in the state and federally? 
or just federally? Uh, both specific to this investigation, it would be it would be both. Yes. Okay. Can you tell the jury what FFL stands for? Yes. So an FFL is a federal firearms licensee. I think we heard testimony I've seen here before um, from uh, Kami Back. She was the employee from the gun store in Oxford, as we're referring to it. Uh, <clears throat> that would be a federally licensed uh, gun store, which is the technical term for that is a federal firearms licensee. And in order to become a, a licensee, uh, what what does that uh, seller have to do or comply with? So there, there's a uh, an application process that they have to go through with the ATF to become a federal firearms licensee. And then, as as a, um, are there guidelines or, or requirements they must follow? Yes. All right. We're going to get to that in a minute. Do you do you know uh, James Crumbly? I do. And how did you come to know James Crumbly? Uh, I became aware of who James Crumbly was on um, the date of the shooting on, on November 30th, 2021, uh, and I had contact with him inside of his residence during uh, an execution of a search warrant that night. Do you see him in the courtroom here today? I do. Can you describe something he's wearing? Uh, he's wearing uh, a white shirt, a blue tie, and uh, headphones. May the record reflect he's properly identified the defendant, Your Honor. The record will reflect in court identification of the defendant, James Crumbly. Thank you. What, if anything, did you review uh, in your role as officer in charge in this case? Uh, a, a vast amount of information. So um, there would be uh, the returns of seven cell phones that were forensically attracted, uh, social media returns, um, financial information, uh, firearms records, including from the uh, federal firearms licensee, um, and, and other documents and records, and uh, surveillance video, obviously. You were in the court. Were you in the courtroom when Ed Wagrowski testified about forensic cell phone data? Yes. And do you have? Do, can you tell the jury what software or program you used? He yes. Used? Objection, yes. Your Honor. Uh, the question is what officer, or I'm sorry, Mr. Wagrowski used. I don't know that Mr. Brandon, Agent Brandon, knows that. I, I corrected myself in that question purposely to say what you use. Are you aware of what what was? The investigation tool they used in what the cell phones. But the ATF. They both did. I'm trying to lay a foundation. Are you aware of? Is, may I ask the questioner? Go ahead. Are you aware of, of that tool? Yes, it was the same tool. So Detective Borowski used uh, Cellbrite to put it in a readable format, and he spoke about a readable format. It's Cellbrite, and that's the format that I reviewed the forensic extractions in. Okay, which is what I was trying to get at. You, you have experience. Do you have experience in this investigation reviewing the cell byte information, which is the cell phone uh, data? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to draw your attention to November 30th of 2021 um, and uh, ask you to first explain uh, where you were uh, when you heard about the shooting. So I was in the, uh, the ATF headquarters for the, uh, the Detroit Field Division it's in downtown Detroit. I was in an office. Uh, that I shared at the time with my partner, um, and the assistant special agent in charge at the time uh, came in. He knew I was from the Orient Oxford area and let me know that there was a shooting at Oxford High School. You were you currently are there, or you grew up there? Both. All right. What what did you do? Um, I grabbed my bag and I ran out the door. Did you um, go with anyone else? Was the it, was it discussed about what you were planning on doing, what the plan was, who was going, who wasn't going? No, I just ran out the door and got to my car um, in the uh, parking structure, turned on the lights and sirens, and then drove up uh, I-75 uh, in towards the direction of Oxford High School. Do you typically work with a partner? Yes. Was he there that day? He was. Did you let him know you were going, or did he come with you? Uh, at, the at the beginning, uh, at the time, no, I, I didn't let him know. He was out, stepped out for a minute, and I, um, uh, I didn't even think about it. I was so focused on getting to the school. Okay. Uh, about how long or does it take to get from Detroit to Oxford School? Uh, it depends on traffic. It can be an hour. It could be more. It could be a little bit less, just depending on uh, the time of day. And did you have a familiarity with the area? Yes. Okay. What, if anything, did you know about that incident when you left? All I knew when I left was that there was a shooting. Um, as I drove northbound, I did receive information from our intelligence unit that there was a confirmed shooting. It uh, was not a um, false alarm. Okay. And what did you do as a result of that? Uh, I continued to drive uh, north on I-75 um, and 
at, at some point, I believe it was in Troy, met up with other law enforcement, forming like a caravan, like others have tested, uh, Detective Grouski testified to, um, traveling north on 75, and then getting to the exit at exit 81, where the old palace of Auburn Hills used to be. Um, so the caravan, were there other people on the highway? Yes. There were, did all this whole caravan, was it just law enforcement? Uh, it was it was law enforcement. I believe at one point there was even a news truck trying to follow the, the caravan. I wasn't sure if they were aware, but I, they, I think they were just running parallel with the uh, caravan. And were there, was it licensed sirens? Yes. Okay. What kind of rate of speed? I was, it was very fast, but it was as, as safe as we could be. Okay. Can you tell the jury and describe what it was like driving up to Oxford School that day? Your Honor, I'm going to object to the relevance. Yeah, why is it relevant? Because uh, he's describing the scene and what he did and how he got into the school, um, and it was the, the scene of the shooting, and he was part of the investigation of the shooting. Okay, so start there. So you arrive at the scene, you arrive at Oxford High School. Is that where you went first? Yes. Okay. Can you describe the scene in terms of, was it easy to get there, were there cars, were there students? Uh, so as, as we're getting to the school through, obviously, Lake Orion and Oxford, it's travel through there, um, you know, all the cars were parked on the right side of the road. And so, you know, um, it was almost like the left lane, there were no cars in it, and people knew what was going on at that point. It's, it, 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 it had seemed that that word had spread because no one was moving. It wasn't just like you normally would get over and then get back over in the left lane. People were just parked on the road. Um, as I got in uh, towards the, the school, um, I started noticing that there was a large group of people at the mire. Um, and obviously learned later that that was the reunification point. Uh, when I arrived at the school, um, there were uh, a lot of law enforcement personnel. I don't I can't even put a number on it. It was, it was dozens, maybe a hundred, uh, in the main vestibule area where like the front offices were located. Um, and I so when you arrived, were there more than one law enforcement agency? Was there more than one represented? Yes, there were there were quite a few. Okay. Did you know anything about where the um, alleged shooter was, where what, whether there were victims? What what did you know when you approached the building? At that point, uh, I had a conversation with someone in our intelligence group that had confirmed related information uh, that they had received that uh, there were fatalities, there were injured, uh, there were injured victims. Um, did you know whether or not the shooter was in custody? No, I, I didn't. Uh, I assumed that. Uh, I didn't hear any, any gunfire when I got to the school, so I, I assumed that either the shooter was in custody or it was a barricade. I, I wasn't sure what was going on, but I knew that it was not an active shooting scene. Uh, did you do anything before you entered the building? Did you were you carrying a weapon? Were you? Yeah, so I, I you know um, put on my vest and then ran to the front of the school with other people from the parking lot that were approaching the school. Um, as I got closer, uh, the person at the door verified my identity as a law enforcement officer, and then at that time uh, was informed that the shooter was in custody and that they were starting uh, kind of to figure out who was going to be responsible for what inside of the school. As you can imagine, it was a very chaotic scene. And okay. that's, you mentioned a vestibule when you uh, earlier. What what do you mean? It was like the front area in front of like the front of the school where you'd have like offices where you check in if you were you know taking your kid kid out sick for the day. Um, it was the main office area, um, and that's where I was directed to, to meet with Lieutenant Willis, who was the identified as being the officer in charge of the scene. Is there a difference between the phase of clearing a crime scene versus evidence collection? Yes. Can you tell the jury what the difference is and when, what comes first and, and what, that, what that is like? Sure. So, uh, at least the way ATF is trained, it would be an active shooter response would be a train and, and to, to find and eliminate the threat. After that has occurred, you have a clearing of the school, tactical clearing of the school to ensure there's no other bodies, secondary devices, or things of that nature. Um, in this instance, it became became clear that there were two things going on at once. There was people uh, volunteering to clear the school for a second time, and then there was uh, Lieutenant Willis who was directing more of the investigative aspects of this case. When you arrived, where uh, do you know if you know about what time you arrived? I don't, I don't recall exactly what time I arrived. No. Okay. Were there still students in the school? Uh, not, not. If there were, uh, and they, if they were in classroom, I wasn't aware of it. I did not see any students when I got to the school. Is was part of your role to uh, engage in in clearing the school? 
So generally, yes, with ATF, we would be involved in, in clearing the school, the active shooter response, the clearing of the school, and then the investigation. I mean, when you got there that day, did you did you help clear the school? I did not. I, uh, based on the fact that the investigation had, had started, that the shooter was in custody and they had the weapon um, secured, I thought the best use of my abilities as, a, as an ATF agent would be to start the trace of the firearm to determine uh, how it ended up there. Okay. Um, you just said you, you found Lieutenant Willis, is that correct? Yes. Okay, where was he standing? He was standing in, in front of the school offices. Um, at one point he was standing on a chair directing people around. Like I said, it was a very, very chaotic. Um, but uh, I found Mr. Uh, Lieutenant Willis and I believe someone had told him I would be coming to help trace the firearm. And, and that's when I went over and, and uh, located it. And before that, did, had you ever met Lieutenant Willis? No. Okay. And um, what, what happened next? Uh, so Lieutenant Willis held up a uh, trash bin that had uh, the murder weapon, um, several magazines, ammunition, and the shooter's cell phone inside, and I was able to take uh, photographs of it. Okay. A trash bin, a, a, a plastic trash bin? A... Yeah, so a trash bin, not, not a uh, uh, one you throw like a school lunch in, but like a small one you have in like an office, like a square or rectangle trash bin. And, and if you know, what was it doing there, or how did it get there? Uh, it was my understanding that that evidence was placed in there to keep it safe while they were continuing to clear the school. Okay. And uh, you said he held it up, and then what happened? Uh, I took photographs of the evidence, uh, specifically the markings on the firearms that I, the firearm that I needed to uh, start the tracing process. And when you say markings, what, what do you mean by markings? So the um, firearms are required to have a make, model, and a serial number. Those three items are necessary to start the trace for ATF to determine where it was first sold. Did you actually physically uh, pick up the, the weapon? I, I don't believe so. I don't think we wanted to uh, we wanted to preserve the evidence. I believe that the firearm was already flipped in a way that had the markings visible. Uh, I believe I just took a photograph of it and then provided that information to the intelligence group that would initiate the actual digital part of the trace. Okay. Um, once you did that, what did you do next? Uh, so once once that process was uh, in was had been started, um, I went to Lieutenant uh, Sam Marsban, who I had known uh, from the Oak County Sheriff's Office based on prior investigations, and in, uh, in Pontiac, and asked what what could be done, what needed to be done. And at that time, I began uh, collecting um, facts for the timeline for a search warrant affidavit for the Crumley's uh, family residence. Okay. Did you, well, we'll get, we'll get to that. As part of your investigation, did you ever look at the, the surveillance video of the shooting? Yes. Okay. Um, before we get to that, did you, what, what are the steps uh, and how long does it take to trace, to trace a firearm through the ATF? So every trace, every, the timing of every trace is going to be different based on the records and how fast they're able to get to ATF. So it'll help you to understand the tracing process starts with those three things, right? The make, model, and serial number of the firearm. Once you have that information and you, you input it, um, you can trace it back to the first manufacturer, right? And when the manufacturer is then contacted by ATF, they can tell you which federally licensed gun store they sold it to, and then that gun store has to tell you who was the first person that purchased that firearm. And did you uh, learn who that was? Yes, it was an individual in Rochester, Michigan, who had obtained the firearm from the gun store in Oxford. And then was that person contacted? Yes. And were they contacted by, by you or someone on your team? Uh, it, was, it was two ATF agents assigned uh, to the same division I'm assigned to. And what, what did they learn? They learned that that individual had sold the firearm back to the Oxford gun store um, sometime in early September. And then what did they do? Uh, they went to the gun store and spoke uh, to Ms. Cammy Back, who testified previously, and learned that the firearm was indeed, in fact, purchased by uh, Mr. Crumley on November uh, 26, 2021. So four days earlier? Yes. Okay. Um, and if we can stop for a moment, did you just say September? I meant November. I'm okay, sorry. thank yeah. you. Thank you to Mr. Peace who pointed that out. Um, November, correct? November, okay. yes. And, yeah. uh, if we want to stop here for a moment, um, walk us through a general purchase of a firearm through a federally um, uh, firearm licensee. Sure. So if you walk into a gun store today to buy a firearm, um, you'd have to fill out what uh, Ms. Beck testified was called the ATF Form 4473. It would have information about yourself as well as information about the firearm you're purchasing. 
uh, the uh, FFL employee then would contact the uh, National Instant Criminal Background Check System, the NICS system, through the FBI. Um, and once they're uh, given the okay to sell you the firearm, they proceed with that. Do you do you know if that that protocol and procedure was followed here? Yes. In this it was. case, all right. Uh, you you just stated that in order to to buy a firearm, you have to have go through all those um, steps. Uh, is that all guns? Do you have to have to go through this process? So for every firearms uh, sale from a federally firearm federal firearms licensee, you do have to fill out the ATF 4473 and have those steps be fulfilled. Yes. Does that include all guns, long guns and pistols? Yes. Okay. And are there differences in long guns versus pistols? Yes. In terms of who can buy them and where? Uh, yes, in terms of age and, and things like that, there are different restrictions on the types of firearms you're purchasing. Okay, and in general, how would you describe the um, restrictions on what, what is more restricted and less restricted? Sure, so uh, under federal uh, law, if you're going to buy a firearm from a federal firearms licensee, you have to be 21 years of age to buy a handgun and 18 to buy a long gun. That would be either a rifle or a shotgun. All right. Um, and what about registering a weapon? So there's there's no federal requirement for registration of a weapon. Uh, there is, however, obviously based on my experience in this case and others through the task force work, I'm aware obviously in Michigan that there are certain registration requirements for handguns. And why but the same requirements for long guns? No. And do you know why that is? Objection on our speculation. I, I, you know, did you I have to ask him first if he knows that's what I'm trying to do. Did you say in the state there is a federally, but there's a state? Correct. Okay. State of Michigan. Through your position in the ATF, do you know why? I think that's my question. Yes, I thought he did. State of Michigan. It is the state of Michigan. Yes. Thank you. Uh, do you know why there are more restrictions on handguns? Uh, I believe it's due to concealability. Okay. Uh, under state law, um, who can register a weapon? Under state law, uh, register a handgun? Yes. Sir. Okay. So uh, under state law, you can register a handgun at 18 years old, um, but obviously you can't buy one until you're 21 from a federal firearms licensee. So you can, in one way, buy a, a private sale from someone that's 18 to someone that's over 18 uh, and then register that firearm. So I have seen through previous experience that you could register a weapon at 18, uh, a handgun, um, but you could not purchase that handgun from a uh, federally licensed gun store, if that makes sense. Okay. Were you made aware at some point if James Crumbly owned any other weapons other than the weapon he purchased on November 26th? Yes. Your Honor, I'm going to object to the reference of a, of a weapon. I, I don't. I think it's a, a vague question. I think what um, Agent Brandon is aware of is alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and explosives. Um, I think that the classification of, of a weapon is, is vague. If if the prosecution is asking about firearms or handguns or pistols, then I think that that should be the question and not specifically a weapon. Well, this response could clarify that. Correct, Your Honor. Right. So go ahead. Uh, you were made aware um, what what other uh, um, I, the reason I'm using weapon is because I, I don't want to specify because I'd be leading, so I'm trying to get him to to explain it without asking a leading question. Um, were you were you you were made aware what what did he uh, also own or purchase if you know? So in June of that year, he had also purchased a uh, Cobra Classic Derringer and also a Keltec P17 uh, 22 caliber pistol from that same gun store in Oxford. So that was about five months earlier. Yes. Okay. Both were both of those guns bought at the same time. Uh, they were bought within several days of each other, within days of each other, but they were not bought at the same time. And how did, did the gun store have any record of those sales? Yes. And what what was it? So they had the uh, 4473 documenting the sale of the Derringer, as well as a sales receipt and a Michigan pistol sales record documenting the sale to Mr. Crumbly for both the uh, the Derringer and the Caltech pistol. Okay. The so you've indicated now three separate handguns. Is that do I have that right? Yes. Okay. Um, All right, I am going to start asking you in, about each of these handguns and describe 
the difference in, in each. I'm putting on gloves because these are, this is evidence, and I'm going to touch it with my gloves on. Um, and the first, uh, the first um, handgun I'm going to ask you about is the handgun purchased on November 26th. Do you know what type of handgun it was? Yes. What was it? It was a six-hour SP 2022 uh, with a, a specified serial number. And so was it a 9mm? Yes, it was. Okay. This is not. This is All right. So before I do that, Special Agent Brandon, what is the, this, the way to handle a, a, a handgun safely before you even pick it up? I'm, I'm, I know there are firearm safety guidelines, but how do you make sure when you're handling a weapon for the first time that you're doing so in a safe way before? <laughs> Object relevance, Your Response? I think the, um, the, the element of, of the crime that, that the defendant is charged with goes back to a legal duty in handling and storing a, a firearm. And so I absolutely think it's relevant. Okay, do you mean picking it up or? In every way. Okay, I'm allowed. Thank you. How, how do you safely pick up a handgun? Sure, so it, based on the fact, so there is a zip tie in it, so everyone is aware that firearm has been made safe already, but um, for the purposes of this, so if you, if you pick up the firearm, you want to keep it pointed in a safe direction, you want to keep your finger off the trigger, and you want to visu visually and physically inspect the chamber of the weapon and the magazine will up and to make sure that it's not loaded. Okay, so I'm going to pick up this. We know that this, is this the murder weapon? Yes, it is. All right, and we know that this has a zip tie in it. Correct. Okay. Can you, um, can you specify what exhibit number that is? Yes, I'm sorry. 163. 163. I think it's either admitted or there's no objection to it. Correct. Okay. okay. This is the murder weapon. There's a zip tie in it. Um, but if, even if there isn't, the, the general um, principle is to make sure the firearm is safe. You want to, you just said you physically examined the magazine well. Is, is that this right here? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And then you also have to do a second step, did you say? Yeah, so the same thing. So I would say physically and visually inspect the, the chamber of the weapon. So down the barrel, if you look down the barrel right, so there, right here, yeah, to make sure there's not a round inserted into the, the chamber of the firearm. Okay. And again, there's a zip tie in here, but uh, in order to, to comply with that, you'd have to physically inspect to make sure there's no round in this chamber. Correct. And why, what's the reason for that? Uh, so with, with firearm, there's there's four basic principles of firearm safety. I, I mentioned two of them. Number one is to treat every firearm like it's loaded. Number uh, two is to point the firearm in a safe direction. Three would be keep your finger off the trigger. And then obviously not for court purposes, but if you're at a, a range or shooting, is to, to be mindful of your target and what's beyond it. Uh, at least that's the way ATF trains the four pillars of firearm safety. Um, so the purpose would be to make sure that firearm's not loaded, that in case the, the trigger was accidentally or, or uh, uh, unintentionally discharged, that there's not an actual round in the chamber to be discharged. Is it possible for a firearm to discharge without touching the, um, the actual trigger? That would depend on a lot of different factors, including the, the type of firearm. Okay. I can't, probably can't answer that question. Okay, thank you. Uh, so you, you mentioned earlier that you have to identify certain markings. Um, where are, and I'm going to give you some gloves if you don't mind. We practice with the gloves, so it doesn't make this long, but it's still. Okay, um, if you wouldn't mind standing, if, the if that's okay with the judge, okay. um, I'm going to hand this, this uh, uh, um, handgun to you, safely pointed down, so you can show the jury what markings um, you're, you're talking about to identify the weapon. So as you can see right here, it's kind of hard to see with the light, but it says Sig Sauer, that would be the manufacturer. And then you have the serial number as well as the caliber generally also uh, stands on there as well. I'm going to put this safely back into its box. Um, and then, do you do you know what these are? Yes, those are the pistol magazines that come with the six-hour SP 2022. Okay, and just 
in case there are people on the jury that don't have a familiarity with handguns, um, what what are these for? What's inside here, usually? So in a semi-automatic pistol, uh, you would load your ammunition. Those magazines, I believe, contain uh, can take up to 15 rounds. So you load the 9mm ammunition uh, to capacity to 15 rounds and then insert that into the uh, firearm. And then once you send the slide forward, that is what allows a round to be chambered into the firearm to be ready to be uh, discharged. So it has a 15-round capacity. So it would have a 15-round magazine capacity. Uh, you can also fit one round in the chamber. So that firearm has a total capacity of 16 rounds. Before you would have to reload? Yes. Okay. Um, so... <clears throat> Can you explain to the jury what semi-automatic means? So a semi-automatic firearm means that for every pull of the trigger, it only fires one uh, projectile from the firearm, uh, as opposed to an automatic uh, firearm, which would be that if you pull the trigger one time, multiple rounds are dispelled from the firearm with one pull of the trigger. The other two weapons you stated were a Derringer and a, and a 22, correct? Uh, it was a 22 caliber Derringer and a 22 caliber Cobra Classic, uh, or a uh, 22 caliber Caltech pistol. Okay, so Caltech. All right. What um, what is the difference between the those two guns and a nine millimeter? So a, a Caltech, uh, the Caltech pistol is also a semi-automatic pistol. It's just uh, chambered in 22 caliber as opposed to nine millimeter. It's a smaller round, um, and uh, the Derringer. And, and again. You say round, and I think for lay people they think of that as many. But what do you what do you mean when you say round? So I know that there's been some talk in this trial about bullets. Bullets are the part of the, fire, the piece of ammunition that comes out of the firearm when it's shot. The uh, the round of ammunition is what's inserted into the magazine before it's fired. Um, that has the you know the cartridge fired cartridge case, the bullet itself, and then some type of propellant or uh, powder, usually smokeless powder. Okay, so a bullet is what comes out of the shell casing. And is expelled from uh, the the chamber, but a round includes the shell casing and the bullet and any kind of what was the last thing? Yes, it would be like the, the powder that's used to uh, to yeah they, yeah. So okay. they would be the the round of ammunition is the actual full piece of ammunition prior to being fired. Okay, uh, and does the twenty two that that James Crumley owned does it? Does it shoot or fire faster? Does it have a, a, a larger capacity magazine? So I'm not I'm not uh, an expert on, on ballistics and traveling the speed on, of firearms, but as far as capacity goes, it's a uh, it's got I think the Caltech P17 has a 17 round total capacity, um, but the actual uh, round of ammunition itself, the nine millimeter versus the 22, the nine millimeter is going to be uh, a wider round. So the what the caliber refers to is the diameter of the bore, the inside of the barrel. Uh, so it means that the nine millimeter round is bigger, and uh, and based on the, the size of the round, it, it's it's got more, um, uh, it's going to be heavier. So the damage from that round would be more than a twenty two caliber round. Does that make sense? Uh, what what kind of um, handgun does law enforcement usually carry? Nine millimeter generally. From at ATF, we carry a nine millimeter, and most of the departments and agencies I, I work with carry nine millimeters. And do you know why, Your Honor? I would object to relevance. It goes to the, the power um, and the use for a 9mm versus the, the weapon that, uh, the, the two handguns that James Crumbly already owned. I, I guess I would normally agree with you, but we've heard on testimony in this trial um, that the shooter was intent um, even after the family owned two other guns on having the spotted by a 9mm. So I'm, I'm going to allow it. Thank you. Can you tell the jury why law enforcement usually carries a 9 millimeter, or, or you do with ATF, if, sure. you know, if you know? Sure. So my understanding, based on, on, on the reasoning that ATF uses in other agencies, is that it's a, uh, it's a, it has a, it's a powerful round that can be used to neutralize a threat. It's not going to over-penetrate, and the uh, advancements in ballistics have made a 9 millimeter uh, the ideal round for law enforcement for, uh, for, for using in defense. And to put this into context, the hundreds of shooting investigations that you've conducted or have, have been a part of, uh, do you, are those, are those done normally with a 22 or 9 millimeter or something else? If you can, if you can say sure. generally. I, I don't think, I, I, I can't recall working a, a shooting with more than one victim involving a 22 caliber firearm. I, I can recall several 
uh, shootings that I've worked in the past with multiple victims involving a 9 millimeter. All right, thank you. I'm going to put this back in the evidence box and hand it to Lieutenant Willis, who is in charge of... Pardon me, we approach, please. Okay, thank you, Judge. I appreciate that. All right, so, all right, I'm going to um, now uh, introduce um, Exhibit 164. And okay, what, what is this? That's the Cobra uh, ENT Classic two shot 22 caliber Derringer purchased by uh, Mr. Crumbly. <laughs> Uh, I believe he paid for it on the 15th of June of, the, of 2021 and picked it up on the 16th of June 2021. Okay, and this is pretty small. Yes. Okay, so what what is this used for, typically, if you know? And how many rounds can it hold? Um, it, can, it can hold two rounds. I mean, in today's... Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know if I can say exactly what it's used for. People use firearms for very different purposes, but... Um, you know, I know that that's been used in the past for a, a variety of different things. Okay. Thank you. Um, and again, this was purchased when, if you know? Uh, it was June 16th of 2021. Okay. And that was 164. This is 165, and again, um, do you know what this is? Yes, that's the uh, Caltech P17 22 caliber pistol purchased by Mr. Crumbly on June 17th of 2021. Okay, and um, if you know, how is this 
was this weapon made safe by you or somebody else before uh, yes. I handle it? Yes. And how was it made safe? Uh, so I, when I we I was going through the uh, from last trial, cutting off the zip ties and putting new ones on. I uh, racked the slide three times, made sure there was no round in the chamber, and then myself and Lieutenant Willis installed zip ties on firearms. Okay, so there's a zip tie in this? Yes. Okay. And, um, again, can you tell the jury what this is? What caliber of weapon is this? Yes, that's a 22 caliber uh, pistol. Okay. And, um, in a moment we're going to see um, the, the defendant's son handling um, a, a video. Is this, is this the weapon? that he was handling in that video? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to hand this to you because I'd like you to explain to the jury um, how to safely handle this weapon in terms of what the safety means on and off. Um, can, can you do that? Yes. Okay. Sure. So this is the uh, Caltech P-17 pistol. Um, so it's it's not an official phrase, but it's what one a lot of people use is red means dead. So when the safety is off, you can see the red dot. So to gauge the safety, you have to, you know, put the safety up. I don't think it's going to do that now with the, oh, it'll go up now. Yeah, with the zip tines, it's not as hard to get the sliding all the way forward. But now the safety would be engaged. So if you pull the trigger, it would, it's not supposed to fire. Um, and when you come back down, that means red means dead. That means the safety is off. Okay. And that, um... And is this also, do you use a magazine with this gun? Yes. Okay. And how many rounds, if you know, does it hold? 16 rounds in the chamber, one round in the, uh, or in the, mag in the magazine, one round in the chamber for a total of 17. Okay. Were there um, any gun cases recovered in the home. Yes. All right. Um, I'm handing you what's exhibit, People's Exhibit 166. Uh, can you tell the jury what that is? Yes, this is the uh, pistol case that goes with the uh, Keltec P-17 pistol that I was just holding. Uh, it was located in the kitchen under the, um, like I said, island in the, in the kitchen of the Crumley residence. Okay, and can you, if, if you wouldn't mind standing and showing how that is opened and what it looks like. I mean, this is the uh, six hour, the cable lock that comes with the six power sour pistol that was we're, uh, we're gonna get to that in inside the Celtic box. So, this is exhibit, proposed exhibit 42. Um, this case was, was this, was this cable lock found in this case? Yes. Okay. And you said it was located in the kitchen? Yes. Where exactly in the kitchen, if you know? I believe it was one of the cabinets underneath the island of the kitchen or a kitchen cabinet. Okay. Was there any gun in it? No. Okay. Thank you. That's the Caltech box, right? This yes, is the, This is the Caltech box, 166. All right. And um, was there any other case found in the home? Yes, one gun of case. Okay, I want to just make the distinction here. Is there a difference between a gun case and a gun safe? Yes. Okay. What 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 is it? And when I'm saying safe, I mean a portable safe. Sure. So a gun a gun case is generally what comes from the manufacturer, um, or sometimes a, a gun store if they're selling you a used firearm will use an, an old gun case to send to give with you. But the Keltec box I was just holding has two holes in it that can be locked. That's a gun case. That's what comes with. Uh, the purchase of a firearm, uh, specifically and a handgun, most of the time. Is this what you're talking about? Yes, there are okay. holes on both sides that a uh, locking mechanism could be run through to lock the case itself. Did you find any <coughs> of those locking mechanisms, or was it was it found just like this? Uh, there was there were no locking mechanisms in it when it was found. Okay, um, I'm going to hand you uh, People's Exhibit 167, and you might have to stand to show the jury so that you can what do. You, do you know what that is? Yes, this is a, uh, it, it's a, uh, a small pistol uh, safe, so it's got a lock, a combination lock, and, um, so it would just, you close the lock, it's typical of your standard combination lock, you close it, spin the dial, and have your, your combination closed. And, um, do you know where that was found in the house? Yes, it was, 
in the uh, on a TV stand in the Crumley, uh, Mr. and Mr. Mrs. Crumley's bedroom on the right hand side inside of a cabinet. All right, and were there anything? Was there anything in it? Yes. What was in it? So there was the uh, Heltec P17 pistol as well as a Derringer 20, uh, two shot, uh, 22 caliber uh, handgun as well, both inside this uh, safe. And that was the the small uh, gun that. I that we just showed the jury, correct? Correct, yeah, they both fit in here. And then the Caltech that you just showed them with the safety? Yes. Those two weapons? That's okay. correct. So, there's a combination on this thing? Yes. And do you know um, what the combination was? Was? Well, I know what it is, I just, I just opened it, it's zero, zero, zero. Okay, was this the combination uh, at the time when this Safe was found. Yes. Okay. Um, does the SIG fit in that gun case? It does not. Gun, gun safe. Gun safe. It does not fit. Even, even if it's just by itself without any other handgun. Correct. Okay. Was there any other case found in the home? Yes. And I'm going to hand you. What's been marked is People's Exhibit 41. And what is this? This is the, uh, you know, go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Uh, this is the Sig Sauer uh, SP-2022, the murder weapon. Uh, this is the pistol case that would have came with it. Similar to the Caltech, it does have two holes uh, to be locked um, as well. Okay. And I'm going to open that. Uh, where was this found, if you know? This was found on the uh, on top of the bed in the uh, Mr. and Mrs. Crumley's bedroom. Was there anything in it? Uh, at the time, no. It looked like this. Okay. Is there any? Was there anything underneath the phone? I, I learned later that there was. Yes. Okay. Can, do you want to tell the jury what that was? Yes. So there is a uh, a receipt for the SP uh, 2022 from the gun store in Oxford, as well as the uh, ATF. Youth Handgun Safety Act notice pamphlet that was previously discussed. Okay, and is that something they have to provide? Yes. All right. Um, Special Agent Brandon, what was your reaction to finding that? What, when did you find that the, the pamphlet was in here? Uh, if you know. During it, for this pamphlet, I, I found that this was in the case during uh, preparation for uh, the trial of Mr. Mr. Crumley's wife. And did you know where it was at, um, up until that point? Yeah, I don't no. want to object to relevance on this line of questioning. About where it was. Mm -hmm. I guess I didn't really understand the question where that box was. So I don't want to put words in his mouth, but as an offer of proof, um, it was not clear to Special Agent Brandon, based on the crime scene and the uh, and the search of the home, um, where the ATF pamphlet was that he knew must have had to have been sold with this gun, and he he picked up the phone and and saw it. Sometime after is what he's saying. Okay. So not the case itself, Your Honor, but the the pamphlet that was within the case, along with the receipt. I I'm objecting to the relevance of questions about that, not the case itself. Okay. Well, I think the the pamphlet being sold with the gun is relevant, and its location in the home is relevant. So I'm going to overrule the objection. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, and. I'm going to ask him about the pamphlet and ask to read excerpts of the pamphlet. And I know that um, opposing counsel actually asked Ed, Ed Wagrowski to do that. So I, I, I'm hoping there's not an objection. Um, but I, I can lay a proper foundation if there is. Okay, did, did, now I don't know if you answered the question about where he found the pamphlet. Didn't. Thank you, Your Honor. What was your um, reaction to that? To finding the pamphlet? Yes. So um, when I looked at the phone and saw the, the pamphlet in there, I was, I was shocked. Okay, why? As, as the pamphlet says on the front, it says Youth Handgun Safety Act Notice. Um, means they were on notice. They had to pick this up and move it to the back of that gun case and basically discard it underneath the phone. Okay, and can you tell the jury what's the purpose of, of the, the law requiring that pamphlet to be given to someone purchasing a gun? The, pur the purpose of it? Do you want me to read from it? First, I want you to tell me the purpose, and then I want you to read. So, the, the purpose of the, the pamphlet is to inform uh, the buyer of the firearm that the that juvenile gun violence is a major problem, and that safely securing your firearm will prevent that from happening. Okay, and if you open it up, 
Where where does it refer to that? So on the first page it says Youth Handgun Safety Act notice, and there's a two there's four bullet points. Uh, the first says the misuse of handguns is a leading contributor to juvenile violence and fatalities. And the second one says safely storing and securing firearms away from children will help prevent the unlawful possession of handguns by juveniles, stop accidents, and save lives. Your Honor, we've marked um, the, the pamphlet as, if, um, we're going to mark it as 168. I don't know if it was admitted previously. We did discuss it in other, throughout other witnesses. Okay, we'll move it to the initial. Yes. Any objection? No. 168. All right. Um, I want to go back to make sure, like the Caltech box, there is the same, these two like little plastic loops. What, what are those? So those are the uh, designed by the manufacturer so that the case is capable of being locked, so you could actually lock your pistol inside that case. Okay. When this was found, do you know if there was any locking mechanism in it at all? There were not. Okay. Um, were the, were the, the three guns purchased uh, by James Crumbly, um, including the SIG for his son, were they, did they have to be registered? Uh, so it's my understanding based on prior investigation as part of the task force and as part of this case that uh, the handguns were required to be, uh, required to be registered in the state of Michigan, yes. And um, what's the timing on that? So if you receive a pistol sales record from a, a federal firearms licensee in the state of Michigan, you have 10 business days to drop it off, or 10 days to drop it off at uh, like a local county sheriff's office, your local police department, um, in this case, obviously, the, the, the murder weapon was purchased four days before, so there was still some time left to, to drop that off. Obviously, that, uh, that never occurred. Okay. Were there any, um, were any of those handguns registered? No. All right. Uh, I want to go back to November 30th for a moment. And um, you said you connected with Lieutenant Mars Band. And what was the purpose of doing that? Uh, so the purpose of, of connecting with him at the time uh, was to help in any way I could. He had started working on a search warrant from the Crum Crumley family residence. Um, and as part of that, um, I offered my assistance uh, with whatever was necessary. Okay. Um, did you have to watch the surveillance video, or did you watch the surveillance video? Yes. Okay. Was um, there anything notable about it? Yes. There were, there were three things that I'm watching the surveillance video from the, the, the shooting that I found relevant. And what were they? So the, the first was uh, the stance that the shooter took um, when, for the shot that, that killed uh, Tate. Um, I noticed that it, he had had some, some type of firearm training. It appeared to me that he did. I remember remarking to the people in the room at the time that that's what I thought. Um, he had taken what we refer to as a shooter stance. His shoulders were rolled forward. His feet were, were spread. Um, so that was, that was the first thing uh, that I noticed. Um, and what did that tell you? I, I thought he had some level of proficiency with firearms, whether he had been to a gun range, whether he had training, um, or, or just been at least introduced to firearms in the past. Okay. And then the second thing? So the second thing was what's called a tactical magazine exchange, or what some other departments call a combat reload. So uh, after uh, the shooter moved through the school, um, and after reloading his first magazine, his, his firearm was completely empty, so he loaded a fully loaded magazine into the firearm and continued to shoot. Um, after that, after set, firing several rounds, he ejected that magazine, placed it in his pocket, and then inserted a full magazine into the firearm so that he was um, fully loaded in the firearm. And what's the purpose of that? Why is that significant? So the way we're trained, at least for, for law enforcement shootings, is that if you're involved in an incident, you always want to have as much ammunition as possible. So if you have a, a, a brief moment where the gunfire is low in the gunfire, if you're in a gunfight, would be to eject your partially loaded magazine, insert a full one, but not to throw it on the ground and keep it for later in case you need it. Okay. What's the third thing? So the third thing was when uh, the shooter came out of the bathroom and surrendered to law enforcement. Uh, prior to them coming down the hallway, he took the uh, magazine out of the firearm and made, he, did, he forgot to, uh, ra or, uh, didn't rack it around out of the chamber, so there was still a round in the chamber, I believe, but he took the magazine out and placed it on top of a trash bin, uh, which I found uh, 
unique, um, not something that someone would do if they had just committed a mass shooting. After viewing that, um, what did you do next as a result of, of noting those three things? So uh, my responsibility at the time was to help you know, Lieutenant Marsman create a, a timeline for the affidavit. Um, after noting those things, uh, I, the following day, the day after the shooting, I began uh, to start an investigation thinking that the shooter had been to a gun range, um, contacted a gun range in the area, and confirmed he had, in fact, been to the range. How did you know which... How did you pick that gun, that gun range? Uh, it's, it's probably the most popular gun range in the area and for driving distance from the Crumley residence. All right, and um, as a result of your investigation leading to looking at gun range visits, um, what was uncovered? So uh, at the gun range, we were able to, it was gun range in Clarkston, um, able to locate uh, surveillance video for, for two instances as well as receipts for visits. I believe there was... Uh, Numerous visits. I believe it was around eight total visits. And were there any other tools in the investigation you used to determine uh, visits to gun range and who was there and at what time? Yes. So in addition to the actual records and surveillance video, um, review, forensic review of the uh, extractions of the, uh, the uh, Mr. Crumley's cell phone as well as his son's and uh, Mrs. Crumley's, uh, put together more visits to the ranges as well as videos of those instances. All right. Um, I'm going to show um, just one moment here. Let's start with June 15th of 2021. Do you um, do you know why that date's significant? Yes, that was the date uh, Mr. Crumley initiated the purchase for the uh, the Derringer. Okay, and the slides uh, in Peoples 169. Uh, what are we looking at? This is a Facebook conversation between James and Jennifer Crumley on the 15th of June, 2021. Okay, now time, it says UTC minus 4, 11.34 a.m. Is that the actual time? Yes. Okay, and can you read the text? And Blue, who, who's, what does Blue indicate, which person? Blue is uh, Jennifer Crumley, green is going to be James Crumley. Okay, and can you read those texts? Yes, so, Jen so Jennifer Crumley asks, uh, talk at 12, and then uh, Mr. Crumley responds, taking Ethan to store at 12, and then Mrs. Crumley asks if you get gun. Okay, and then the next? Uh, Mr. He, Crumley... He's answering her? Yes. Okay. Mr. Crumley responds, yes, and Mo, I believe that's supposed to be no. Um, Jennifer responds, huh? And then James says, we paid for the gun and bought it, but can't pick it up till everything clears in Washington, in parentheses, FBI. Could be today, tomorrow, or next day, they don't know. And then Mrs. Crumley responds, gotcha, bring me those fruit punch things when you come to bring him. All right. Uh, the the message about he had to wait. Um, did you, through your investigation, reveal? Did it reveal that that's consistent with what happened? Yes. Okay. And remind the jury why. So sometimes when you purchase a firearm, the background may take a little bit of time, depending on a lot of different factors. Um, and in this case, it. it it took enough time to where Mr. Crumley had to come back the next day to pick up the fire. Okay, and then the next exhibit, People's 170. Do you know what that is? Yes, this again is uh, Facebook messages between James and Jennifer Crumley. Uh, Blue is, is Jennifer, and she says, how much is your gun? Uh, and Mr. Crumley replies, 300. All right. I'm going to show you what's been marked as, uh, and admitted as People's 29. Um, what this is a receipt for? Um, what is it for? Do you know? This is the receipt for the Cobra for the Derringer. Uh, this is dated 6:15. It says 16 at the 6:16 at the top, which is the date the actual sale went through, and it's for 180 dollars and 15 cents. So this is not 300 dollars. This is was there a gun he purchased that was 300 dollars that day? Approximately yes. And what gun was that? Uh, that would have been uh, the uh, Caltech P17 22 caliber pistol. Okay, so the Derringer, the small one, was 169, and this is the receipt for the Caltech. What else is on that receipt? Uh, it's two boxes of ammunition at 14.95. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to draw your attention to June 26, which is about 10 days later. Um, do you know if James Crumbly went to the gun range at that on that date? Yes. 
Yes, this is, a, a, again, Facebook messages, messages between James and Jennifer Crumley. Uh, in blue, Jennifer asks, can you guys answer your phone? And then uh, James Crumley responds, no, at gun range, loud. All right. And people's 172 and 173. We're going to play those for the jury, but before you do, before we do, can you tell them what they're going to see? Yes, so the first video is at 12.58 p.m. on uh, June 20th, and it's uh, a video of the shooter's son uh, shooting the Caltech pistol at the gun range, and then the following video is a, a video of the shooter's, of the, um, the defendant's son shooting the uh, Derringer at an outdoor gun range uh, a couple minutes later. Okay. Same range? Both? Yes. He sent them that day or the next day, but he did send them to uh, Mrs. Crumbly at some point. All right, and how do you know that? Uh, I reviewed her cell phone as well. Okay, and Exhibit 174, can you tell the jury what that is? Yes, so that is uh, one of the videos being sent on June 21st, 2021. All right, and the, this is two slides, I mean, this two slides, can you give me one slide? And then, is this the second video? Yeah, this is the, well, this is the, in, in the reverse order. So the first, the, the, they're both videos were sent from James Crumbly to Jennifer Crumbly on June 21st, 2021. Okay, so th these exhibits are him sending her the videos? Yes. All right, were you, did you learn if she, what she did with the videos, if anything? Yeah, she took one of the videos and uploaded it, uh, I believe is an Instagram story. Okay, and that's exhibit 175. says in addition to the video. Sure. It says uh, Ethan and it tags, uh, I believe that's Mr. Crumley's Instagram account, um, both got handguns this week testing them out at the range. All right. And then now we're to drawing your attention to June 26. Uh, did they go to the gun range that day? Yes. Do you know where it was? It was at the, the, the so for the rest of these, I believe it's the indoor gun range in Clarkston, Michigan. Okay. And um, uh, exhibit 176, can you tell the jury what that is? Yeah, this is a receipt uh, in the name of James Robert Crumley uh, on June 26, 2021 for one range, uh, uh, handgun range fee of $20 and then one small silhouette uh, target at 75 cents. 
Did do you know if the videos were taken on that day? Yes. Do you know if they were sent to anyone? I do. And who were they? If who were they sent to? Uh, Jennifer Crum. Okay. Um, drawing your attention to Exhibit One Seventy Seven. What is that, if you know? This is a video sent from Jennifer or from James Crumbly to Jennifer Crumbly of the shooter at the firearms range in Clarkston on June 26th. Okay. And is 178, which is admitted, I believe, um, is this the video that was taken and sent to, to Jennifer? Yes, this is actually, the, I believe, is the Instagram story that was created from that video okay. and uploaded to Instagram by Jennifer Crumbly. Can you tell from the video which, uh, which, which um, firearm he's using? Yes, that's the Caltech P17, uh, 22 caliber pistol. Okay. Drawing your attention to July 2nd, uh, did you uncover any evidence that that James um, and his mother-in-law, Jennifer's mother, um, went to the range with the shooter? Yes. And how did you um, discover that? So there were messages between uh, James Crumbly and his mother-in-law on Facebook. Um, discussing a range visit. I think it's, the conversation occurs on July 2nd, 2021, but it's actually for a range visit occurring on, I believe, July 3rd, 2021. Okay, can you read that to the jury? Sure. So in blue is going to be uh, James Crumley's mother-in-law. She says, still planning on taking uh, the shooter to the gun range tomorrow morning. Then lunch, is he still available and do we need to make reservations? Uh, Mr. Crumley responds, he is good, no reservations needed. I'll go with you guys. Um, his mother-in-law replies, awesome, glad you could join us. We don't know what we are doing, LOL. And then, this is 377. 377. And then the next um, response from James? Uh, just take Maybe Road up to Dixie, turn left, and it will be on the right-hand side. Uh, the shooter will be excited. We will rent a few different guns. They have a special for 9mm on 25 for a box of 50. Uh, his mother-in-law re uh, replies, sounds great. Uh, Mr. Crumbly says, make it closer to 1045. All right, and do we have any video from that day? We do not. Uh, do we know um, on that uh, who was there? Well, first, it's 179 and 180. Can we? What are those? Those are receipts uh, from uh, July 25th. Those are not from that visit. Okay, so now we're to July 25th. Yes. And what are those? What do those receipts show? Uh, so on the the left hand side of the screen uh, is a. Uh, Looks like a purchase of ammunition for six boxes of 22 caliber ammunition for a total of 47.90 or 50.82 at the bottom, and then on the right it's a range visit um, by Mr. Crumbly. Um, it's a handgun range fee of twenty dollars, a small silhouette. Uh, I should mention that the receipt on the left also is in the name James Crumbly. What's a silhouette mean? Uh, it's a it's a silhouette of a person uh, that's used at a, at a gun range. Okay, and Exhibit 181, can you tell the jury what that is? Yes, so this is geolocation information for uh, the Gmail account for James Crumbly. Um, and for, I believe he is in green on this. Uh, and then the purple dots would be Jennifer Crumbly, meaning on July 25th, 2021, both Jennifer and James Crumbly were at the firearms range in Clarkston, uh, Michigan. Okay, I'm drawing your attention to August 15th. Uh, exhibit 183. This is a receipt. What is it for? This is dated August 15, 2021. Uh, the receipt has a range uh, range fee of $20 again. Um, I believe that's four. So it'll be 200 rounds of 22 caliber ammunition and one small silhouette. Again, a silhouette of a person uh, target. And 184. What is this? This is uh, James Crumley's uh, Gmail uh, geolocation information showing he was at the Clarkston gun range at that time. Okay, and you were here for Ed Wagrowski's testimony, correct? Yes. All right. Did you see the video that the shooter sent to his friend in August of 2021? I did. All right. I'm going to um, put 70 and 71 up on the um, screen. That's one slide. Um, first, what, what, are you, what are we looking at? So this is the first video filmed by uh, the defendant's son, on August 19th, around 9.30 p.m., that was sent to his uh, friend. All right, and what what time was it? It was 9.31 p.m. Okay. 
And can you see that video? Can you stop it right Okay, I'm stopping. Uh, Mr. Peace is stopping it. What, what are we looking at? So this is uh, the defendant's son holding the Caltech P-17 pistol. Uh, it doesn't appear to have a magazine inserted. It didn't appear to have a round in the chamber. Uh, the safety was, you know, again, red means dead. The safety was uh, not engaged. Okay. And then can you continue? All right. Can you tell, based on, uh, I should probably lay a better foundation. Were you ever inside the Crumbled home? Yes. When were you there? Uh, on the night of November 30th, 2021, the night of the shooting, we uh, executed the search warrant there. Okay, so you were there during the search? Yes. Okay. Do you recognize anything in that video that signifies where the shooter was? I do, but not from being in the, the residence. It was from other um, cell phone extractions from, I believe, Mrs. Crumbly and Mr. Crumbly's phones. I believe they changed couches in that, that living room at some point. It was, an old, it was a black leather couch that I recognized being in the living room. Okay. All right, um, Exhibit 72 and 73, the, the, they've both been previously um, admitted. Can you tell the jury what this is? This is uh, the video that I believe Detective Wabrowski um, had testified to previously. It was uh, sent to the de uh, defendant's son's friend by the defendant's son on August 20th at 1230 in the morning. All right, and was there a, a text that accompanied this right after or before the video was sent? Yes, it was around the time that the, the video was sent. I believe it said, um, my dad left it out, so I thought, why not, LOL. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I don't know if that's the exact text, but that's the general idea. Is that the text? Yes, that's it. Okay. And um, we're going to play the video, which has been previously um, admitted. And before we do, can you tell the jury what they're about to see? Sure. So the, de uh, the defendant's son has the uh, Caltech P-17 pistol in his hand. This, again, the safety's not engaged. Um, he slams the firearm down on top of the magazine, loads the magazine, and then charges, sends the slide forward, chambering around into the firearm. Uh, meaning that if he pulled the trigger at that moment, it would go off. Okay. All right. Um, what do you see in that picture besides the Caltech? Here's to be a, a cat. And based on your investigation, do you do you know about that cat? I believe that's. Uh, the shooter's cat, uh, Dexter. All right. And what what surface is that? Can you tell? Yes. So after being in the home for the, the search warrant, uh, I'm aware that that is their, their their kitchen really didn't have a kitchen area. It was more their, their living room or dining room table, so to speak. It was a, a higher kind of four-top table. Um, that is the same wood grain that's on the, the table in their dining room. All right. And we... We know this This was taken at 12.30 a.m., is that what you said? I believe it was sent at 12.30, but I think it was, it was taken relatively close to that time. Okay. Um, do you hear anything else in the background? I, I, all I heard was crickets and then the sound of the magazine and then the slide going forward. Okay, and we've previously introduced the GPS data um, that shows whether or not James Crumbly was in the home during this time. Was he? He was. Okay. Um, okay. All right, if just want to talk to me about this video, uh, Special Agent Brandon, and, um, and, and what your view is on the safe, the, the, whether or not what was happening in that video was safe. So I, I would say that regardless if Mr. Crumley was standing over his shoulder or not, or not, that would not be safe. The firearm is on top of a, a dining room table. It's, it's loaded. The safety's off. Uh, and it's pointed in a direction that if you're inside their home, you can't tell from the video whether he's facing uh, the front of the home or the side of the home, but regardless, the firearm's pointed in a direction that would be almost chest level if a person was beyond the walls of the house or if, if a person was standing nearby. Um, not to mention almost, you know, uh, pointing the firearm at the cat. All right. That's the magazine. Can you tell if it's loaded or not? Yes, that magazine there, you can see the, round of, the rounds of ammunition um, in the firearm. All right, and 
um, you said, did, could you see whether there was a round in the chamber? Uh, I don't believe there was until he loaded the magazine and then sent the slide forward or else it was uh, malfunctioning. Okay, where's he loading? That's loading the magazine. Is that the, that's the safety? Yep, so the safety is not engaged and the round is, uh, yep, the top of the magazine is visible there and if once he sends that slide forward, that's what takes that round and puts it into the chamber. Okay. What if that was being supervised by somebody like James? Would it change your opinion of the safety of that action? No, so based on what we spoke about before being the four rules of uh, firearm safety, so um, obviously that firearm is loaded, so treat every firearm like it's loaded, point it in a safe direction, so there's really no safe direction for that firearm to be if it's chest level on a table. The only safe position would be whether it was outside or pointed at the floor. Um, you know, obviously if you're loading a firearm to carry on your person, you know, if you point it at the floor where it's away from people so it can't hurt anyone if it discharge. Okay. I want to draw your attention to um, September 1st, did the defendant, um, did James and his take a sense of the, the shooting range on that day? Your Honor, yeah. I'm just going to ask for clarification. September 1st of what year? 2021. The weapons weren't purchased until June 2021 and um, November 2021. Yes, I, I believe that. that's correct, yes. All right. And um, Exhibit 185, what is that? It says, uh, it's a Facebook message from James Crumley to Jennifer Crumley, and it says, uh, the shooter and I are headed to the gun range. And Exhibit 186 and 187. Those are uh, receipts from the gun range in Clarkston, in both in James Crumley's name. The one on the left is for uh, range time. Uh, it's like 200 rounds of 22 caliber ammunition, um, two silhouette targets, and then a rental of a uh, 22 caliber revolver. And then on the right hand side is a uh, 150 round box of 22 caliber ammunition. Did there, James take a video of his son that day? Yes. And how do you know? Uh, it was located on, I located on James Crumley's phone. And that's exhibit 188? Yes. All right, we're going to play that. September 25th of 2021, did you come to learn that James took his, his son to the range on that day? Yes. And this is Exhibit 189. What's that receipt for? Uh, so it's a receipt again, and the name's James Robert Crumbly. It's got uh, a range, range fee, uh, a rental of a, um, a 9 millimeter pistol, a 9 millimeter ammunition, 22 caliber ammunition, as well as a torso, uh, black torso target, it says. All right. And this... Do you know if that was a SIG? Uh, that was not. It was a it was a nine millimeter HK VP9. Okay. Um, is there a video of that day? Yes. So uh, the actual gun range surveillance video. This was the furthest back for the range visits that we could get due to the, the footage writing over itself. So September 25th was the first date that we actually could get footage from uh, the gun range in Clarkson. All right. And this is 190. We're going to play that. And what are we looking at here? So this is uh, at the gun range in Clarkson. This is outside of the uh, shooting area. This is where you pay for targets, ammunition, rent firearms. Um, and in the white sweatshirt is Mr. Crumbly wearing the looks like a Seattle Seahawks ball cap. And then you have uh, the shooter wearing a gray sweatshirt, dark colored pants, uh, Nike shoes, and a uh, black hat. And what do you observe um, James Crumbly wearing at his belt level? Uh, appears to be a holster.
And can you tell the jury what what you're observing? So at some point, it looks like uh, the shooter was trying to clear a malfunction from the firearm. Um, he's checking the, the chamber to see if a round's chamber is having some kind of malfunction with it, and he um, is having trouble clearing it. And can you tell what, what firearm that is? Uh, the footage here is real grainy. I, I can't say for certain. And what does he appear to be doing right at this time? So he keeps checking the, the chamber uh, for a round. He's having issues with it. He goes over to his uh, to Mr. Crumbly. They walk back over. Mr. Crumbly takes up the firearm. He uh, racks the slide three times to try to see what's going on with the firearm. And then he inserts uh, the magazine here and uh, gets the firearm back in operating condition. difference between the 9mm ammunition and 22 ammunition? So, ge just generally speaking, the 9mm ammunition is, is more expensive than 22 caliber ammunition. 22 caliber ammunition is more for target practice, and you know, 9mm ammunition can be used for anything from target practice and home defense. It's generally more expensive for 9mm ammunition. And when you say more expensive, can you roughly say about how much, generally? It, honestly, it, to relevance, Your Honor? Yeah, what's the relevance? The relevance is that 9mm ammunition is expensive, and it's typically not something that you would buy just to shoot at the range, particularly if this is your hobby. It's uh, expensive. That calls for speculation, Your Honor. Well, uh, unless, unless he knows. Unless, unless he knows. Is 9 millimeter ammunition because of the cost, is it, is it something that you typically see at a range? People generally, people do shoot 9 millimeter ammunition at the range. Now, what level of money they're willing to pay for that type of ammunition all varies depending on uh, if you're going to shoot at the range, obviously you're going to try to use less expensive ammunition, but I'd be speculating anything beyond that. Okay, thank you. Drawing your attention to October 3rd, was there evidence uncovered that the, that James and his son went to, to the range on that day? Yes. And Exhibit 191, that's a Facebook message? Yes, this is from James uh, Crumbly to Jennifer Crumbly on October 3rd at 12.01 p.m. It says, cool, just got, just got cleaning our guns, leaving for range in a few. All right, and then 192 is a receipt, is it from that day? Yes, it's from October 3rd, uh, 2021, in the name James Robert Crumbly. It's for uh, a silhouette target, a range fee. Uh, I believe that's 100 rounds of 22 caliber ammunition, and then an additional, um, looks like an additional two boxes of 22 caliber ammunition. All right. Drawing your attention now to November 26th of 2021, you testified earlier that you were involved in the tracing of the weapon um, and, and the purchase of it on that day, correct? Yes. All right. And was that 9mm SIG purchased on that day? Yes. I'm showing you previously admitted 37 and 38. We talked about this. What are these? This is the receipt from the gun store in Oxford for the Sig Sauer SP 2022 uh, 9mm pistol that was sold to James Crumbly. All right, and the cost? Uh, it was uh, The gun itself was $489.95. With tax, it was a total of $519.35. All right, and 38 is what? This is the pistol sales record um, that would have been completed by uh, the gun store and signed by Mr. Crumbly documenting his purchase of the uh, Sig Sauer pistol. And were you able to, um, or did you review any posts um, that the shooter made uh, with this firearm purchase for him? Yes. All right, and I want to draw your attention to Exhibit 95, and there are three slides here. What's the first one? So the, the first one, uh, so the text for the post it was uh, November 26th, uh, says, just got my new beauty today, six hour, nine millimeter, ask any questions, I will answer. Uh, it's a picture uh, in the Crumley's kitchen. It's hard to see from this photograph, but there's a yellow. You see yellow and then some wood floor underneath it. That's uh, the counters in their kitchen. So I'm holding the box, so this would be showing through this, this handle with the circle? Correct. Okay. Yeah, 
purchase, and that is the six-hour SB 2022 purchased by James Crumble. All right, and then nine, the, the second slide. This is a picture of uh, the defendant's son holding the six-hour SB 2022 uh, in uh, the Crumley family residence, that's the same floor inside their house. And it's a post? Yes. All right. And it says? It's the same, so the same text appears in all three photographs, but the, there's the second, there's there's the first photograph of just the firearm, second of uh, Mr. Crumley, or Mr. Crumley's son holding the firearm, and then the third uh, picture, I believe, is the uh, Mr. Crumley's son lining up the sights. So on a, on a firearm, there's the rear sights and the front sights, and when you line those up, that's what you're shooting at, that's what you use to aim. Um, and that's where those three dots are aligned. That's uh, Mr. Crumley's son pointing the firearm at the floor inside the residence. All right. Drawing your attention to uh, 97, Exhibit 97. This is, where was this photo found? Uh, this was found on uh, Jennifer Crumley's uh, cell phone. Uh, it depicts the, so the top firearm where you see the red dot again is the Caltech S. Uh, uh, SP, uh, the P-17, uh, and then the bottom firearm is the murder weapon, it's the six-hour SP-2022. This is all inside of uh, the six-hour box, so you see the two six-hour SIG magazines on the right side of the screen, plus the uh, ATF pamphlet and the cable lock provided by six-hour. Okay. Anything stand out to you about this picture? As far as? The ATF. Well, the pamphlet obviously is on top of the foam in this picture, and the, and the cable lock is still in the box with the SIG uh, Sour. Obviously, it was later recovered in a, the Keltec box, not in the box with the SIG Sour. All right, and, and in, tr in, in addition to the ATF pamphlet, is there anything else posted at the, uh, the gun store about safety? Yes, so behind the counter in the gun store in Oxford is the same, same four bullet points that are on the inside left cover of that ATF Youth Handgun Safety Act. Um, it hangs behind the counter. All right. Yes, it's 193. All right. This is this is okay. All right. This is Exhibit uh, 42. What is, what is this? That is the uh, the cable lock that was provided with the six hour pistol. All right. And is this this cable lock is specifically provided with the SIG? With this actual gun? That's correct, yes. Okay. And looking at this, um, I'm going to hand it to you now. I can get another pair of gloves. It's getting a little hot up here. I know. I took mine off too. Is it getting hot in here? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. yeah. It happens all the time. Thank you. I don't know if those are the small ones. That's all right. We're working on it. Definitely smaller ones this time. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I do have the bigger ones. But that's all right. You've got them up. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you to, I'm going to hand this to you, and then I'm going to ask you to tell the jury whether or not you think this has ever been opened. So I would say, <clears throat> is it possible that <clears throat> this top part has been opened? Yes. And this was <clears throat> used consistently and pulled out of this packaging. There'd be more tearing on the side. Um, you know, it's cheap plastic baggie. All right, and what's inside of it um, at the bottom? So there's the instruction manual in here as well as the, the two keys that are still inserted in the cable. Okay, and your testimony is this This is provided with, I'm going to take this back, this was provided with the SIG when it was purchased on November 26th, correct? Yes. And where was this found in the home when you searched it? on November 30th, 2021. That was in the Keltec box in the kitchen. All right, so it was found not in the SIG box. No. So the Caltech box, which is somewhere here. Underneath the SIG box. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the SIG cable lock was found with the, the Caltech. Where was the Caltech? The Caltech box was in the kitchen. Okay, but the Caltech, the weapon, was in a gun safe? That's correct, yeah. The, the, Caltech uh, pistol was in the gun safe in the Crumbly's bedroom. Okay, so this was found open or closed? <clears throat> that was closed. All right, and did you testify earlier this was found in a cabinet in the kitchen? 
I believe it was a cabinet or like a little space in the kitchen underneath like an island or whatever. Okay, and if we go back to the picture that <clears throat> Jennifer Crumbly posted, same cap cable box. Yes. Okay. On November 27th, uh, drawing your attention to Exhibit 195, what is that? Uh, that is a receipt from the range in the name Jennifer Lynn Crumley uh, for November 27, 2021. It's for a um, pistol range visit, uh, one target, and two boxes of Patriot Defense 9mm 124-grain ammunition uh, at $23, or almost $24 a box. Okay, so four days earlier when the gun was purchased, there's, <coughs> is there a video of that? Yes. The purchase of the gun? On the is, it, is there a video of the purchase of the gun? Uh, no, the, the gun store did not have footage uh, for that day. Okay, so but this is the 27th, the next day. Is that a Saturday? I believe so, yes. Okay, um, and is there a video from that? Yes, there was footage <clears throat> at the gun range in Clarkson. There was not footage at the gun store in Oxford. Okay. And do you, you, you've heard all the testimony before, you, were you able to determine where James Crumbly was um, on this day, on a Saturday when, the, um, when Jennifer and the shooter went to the, to the range? Yes, he was working that day doing uh, DoorDash deliveries for most of the day. Okay. Um, all right, it's Exhibit 196. I'm going to play this um, and the first part of it and, and stop for a moment. Um, at the counter, and then move to, I think, just a section uh, at the end, other, because it's long. So sure. just want to let everyone know. Okay, so what are we looking at right now? So <clears throat> the woman holding the, the pistol case, that's the six-hour pistol case, that's Jennifer Crumbly. Behind her is the, the shooter wearing uh, that gray sweatshirt and sweatpants and black shoes. Now, the, she's paying for what, if you know? So right now, I think she just handed him her license. Um, okay. <clears throat> based on, on the receipts for this visit, like I said, there was the, uh, the, the target, two boxes of 9 millimeter ammunition, and then the range visit itself. All right. Stop it there. What is he doing? Uh, he made it two with his with his hand. All right. And how many boxes of ammo did they actually purchase? Uh, uh, two. Your Honor, I'm going to object. It sounds like the prosecution is asking Agent Brandon to speculate as to what the number two could be. There are also two people there. There could be two sets of ear protection. It could be two targets. It could be two of anything. She's asking for speculation. That goes to weight, not admissibility. Yeah, I think it does. Okay. Uh, you don't know what he was referring to. There's no sound. I, I don't. If you play the video and it continues, we'll see what happens next. Okay. Okay. And if you know what what is happening now, uh, it's picking up the target targets and two box of ammunition. And he's ringing the two boxes of ammunition up now. And how much were the two boxes of ammunition for nine millimeters? A nine millimeter. I don't, I, don't I don't recall, um, it would be on the previous slide for the receipt, but I, I think it was around $24. Okay, and what's $24 total or $24 for each box? I believe it was $24 for each box. Okay. All right, we're going to now go to, what happens after they leave here? 
So they pay for their, their range visit, they get their firearm or the, the ammunition, the targets, they then proceed to go uh, put your protection on and walk into the range and begin to load magazines uh, and then take turns firing the weapon. All right, and we're going to um, go to the segment where they're actually firing the weapon. Okay, what's happening here? So in the back, um, the shooter is loading uh, ammunition into the magazines. At, at one point during the video, Mrs. Crumley does help load at least a, a couple rounds of ammunition as well into the magazines, and then they proceed to take turns shooting the firearm. All right, and that's, we're going to speed to a part. Is there some point where he's, um, you're observing him instructing or trying to um, help his mother? Yes. All right. Okay, what are we seeing here? So this is uh, one of the times that the shooter uh, shot the murder weapon. He sends the target down range, loads the magazine into the firearm, and then uh, discharges it several times. Now, as far as you know, in terms of looking at all the evidence, is that the first time he's fired that weapon, if you know? Yes, based on all the evidence I, I, I was able to locate, this is the first time, yes. We're going to um, jump ahead to. Does, if you know, does Jennifer Crumbly ever fire a weapon? Yes, she takes, I think, two total turns firing the weapon, I believe. What are you observing? Right so, in the video, uh, the shooter is instructing his mother how to load a magazine and uh, chamber around. He's, right now, he's pointing to the slide release, telling her how to send the slide forward and, and chamber around from that magazine in the firearm. How many rounds, if you know, did they fire that day? I believe it was a total of, of 50. The, they, it, the, there was two boxes of 50 rounds of ammunition, and they went. They left the range with one full box of 50 rounds. Do you know how many um, she fired versus the shooter? I, I don't know the exact number. I know that it was significantly more for uh, the shooter than his mother. Okay. Do you um, know? If, how do you know that they left with a one full box? Uh, so at the end of the video, um, the shooter packages up the uh, six-hour in the six-hour pistol case, and then uh, hands the, the box. His mom takes the box, Mrs. Crumley takes the box as they leave, and uh, the shooter walks out carrying the box of ammunition. Okay, and we're gonna fast forward to that part. Do you see any, um, can, can you, in watching this video, do, do you, can you, um, is it visible, the actual case? Yes. And do you see a, a lock or the ATF pamphlet? Uh, no, not during this video, no. Okay. And is that the, the SIG case? It is.
Now, is he permitted to carry that gun out of the range? So there, there would be nothing uh, barring him with his mother's supervision right there for carrying the firearm out. Okay. And what about the ammo? Uh, same, same with the ammo. Okay. And we see later, he's packaging it up? Yes. Okay. And we see later them leaving and who's carrying what? Uh, so the, right now he's trying to figure out how to fit all the magazines and the firearm in the, in the pistol case. He eventually successful in doing so, uh, closes the clamps on the, on the firearm case. Uh, his mother walks out with it, and he walks out with the uh, ammunition. Okay. And if you know how many rounds did he take to the school that day? I believe there was a total of 50 based on uh, the number of rounds uh, discharged being 32 and the rounds recovered. We, we talked about the cable lock um, that, that was sold with the SIG. Um, if it had been installed in that uh, firearm, about how long does that take to install a cable lock? Uh, I mean, if the slide's already to the rear of the firearm um, and the magazine port and the ejection port are visible, it would take under 10 seconds. Okay. I want to um, lastly draw your attention to Exhibit 130. What's that? So this is an Instagram post by the defendant's son. Um, it's 100, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, by the defendant's son, uh, after returning from the shooting range, took my new SIG out to the range today. Definitely need to get used to the new sights, LOL. And then there's a picture of his target. All right. And this is a post that Jennifer Crumbly posted that day? Yes, that same day. Uh, Mom and son day testing out his new Xmas present. My first time shooting a 9mm, I hit the bullseye. And this is just a different picture with the same post? Yes, I believe she had three photographs with her post, including the, the six hour on the kitchen counter with the uh, ATF pamphlet underneath. And do you see a cable up? I do not. Okay. Moving to Exhibit 130. This is the math worksheet. Yes. Did you have an opportunity during your investigation to look at this? Yes. And what caught your attention, if anything, at this with this drawing? But the very first thing I noticed was that there was an apparent shooting victim on the drawing. Um, whether it was a fatal shooting, not fatal shooting, I, I'm not certain, but clearly when I looked at it, I, you know, it was not a suicide. Anything else? Yes, uh, so the, the firearm that was drawn on the piece of paper, um, after reviewing the murder weapon, uh, I noted several similarities between the two and, and uh, believed that this was actually a drawing of the murder weapon. And what was similar? So on the back of the murder weapon, there are uh, striations or lines on the slide of the firearm. Um, additionally, the shape of the, what's the trigger guard, so it's the part that where the trigger is housed in, it's that kind of a, I would say that it's like a half U shape uh, where the trigger's inside of, as well as where the ejection port is, and most notably, uh, the magazine. So the, ma the bottom of that firearm, you see how it's not flush, how there's basically two parts there? That part on the Sig Sauer uh, magazine, there's like a lip that's different than other firearms um, that shows how it kind of like curves down in the front. All right, next I'm going to, um, what, what, what about the, is there a picture of an, any um, ammo on that drawing? Yes, there's a picture, uh, pic, a picture of ammunition. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's definitely a pistol, pistol caliber ammunition. It's definitely not 22 caliber ammunition. It does uh, appear to be a nine millimeter round of ammunition, or at least resemble one. Okay, and next I'm showing you exhibits previously admitted um, 97, 101, and 130. What are we looking at? So those are pictures of the murder weapon on either side. Um, you can see the, the markings I was talking about, the striations on the slow back of the slide of the firearm, the shape of the magazine, um, especially when you look on the picture on the right. Um, you see how the, it, it's not a, a flat shape. It doesn't sit flush with the firearm, um, how there's different levels there. Uh, additionally, the uh, location of the ejection port and the shape of that trigger guard again that half kind of u-shape there and special agent brandon my last question is what was your impression when you viewed that drawing when am i impression when i viewed the drawing yes that he, he drew his firearm and the entire drawing did what was your conclusion or what were your impressions through your investigation what was the drawing up he drew a murder Thank you. Nothing further.
Can we take a break at this time, Your Honor? I think the jury's probably sure you need a break, right, Ms. Warren? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, please, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay, I have asked about the heat, but this is an old building, and this happens all the time. I'll work for now while I'll be freezing, so. And then, Your Honor, let's take a time to put you on a break. You can step down. Please have a discussion with us tomorrow. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. All rise for the jury.
All right. James Crumbly, case In November of 2021, you were employed by the ATF, and you also worked um, on a, a, was it a task force? Did I understand that correctly? So at, at the time of the, the shooting, I wasn't on a task force yet. I was working on cases in Pontiac that which morphed into, led into the creation of that task force. In connection with this case, you reviewed a significant amount of information and data in the investigations related to the Oxford High School shooting. Yes. And that would be... Um, specific to Mr. Crumbly, some specific to Mrs. Crumbly, and some specific to their son. Yes. On September 25th of 2021, you testified that uh, that James and his son went to a gun range in Clarkston. September 25th, yes. That they rented a 9mm handgun, if you recall, and I can pull the exhibit up if you'd like. No, that's correct. Okay. That they purchased two boxes of 9mm ammunition. I believe that's the correct quantity, yes. If you recall, the price of those boxes was $29.99 each. I, I don't recall, but that wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me. Okay. That sounds about right for a box, uh, a box of 9mm ammunition. Yes. There was also 22 caliber ammunition that was purchased? Yes. They fired a 22 caliber pistol? Uh, I believe the video we had, yes. And that was the Caltech that's owned by James Crumbly? I, I believe that is the firearm that's depicted, yes. Okay. And you also learned that they, they also fired a 9mm pistol. Yes. Which is the one that they rented. Correct. That was the HK. Yes. In October October 3rd of 2021, they rented the gun range again, they being James Crumbly and his son. Yes. They purchased 22 caliber ammunition. Uh, I don't recall the, the exact receiver that day, but that sounds correct for that day, yes. And in October of 2021, to your knowledge, based on your knowledge uh, of the investigation, there were two pistols in the home, and that was the, and I'm not, there were BB guns as well. I'm sure. not referring to those. Sure. Um, there were two pistols. There was the Derringer, which you've been shown, and the Caltech. Correct. Okay. Those are both 22 caliber handguns. Yes. November 26th of 2021 is when the SIG Sauer 9mm was purchased. Yes. And that was done so by James Crumbly. Yes. And if you recall from the receipt, there was, um, it was a handwritten receipt? Uh, yes, that, the receipt was handwritten, yes. And the receipt had the firearm listed? Yes. The serial number of the firearm? Correct. Prices and, and things of that nature? Yep. Okay. On November 27th of 2021, James Crumbly's wife, Jennifer, took their son to the gun range. I'm sorry, what date was that again? November 27th of 2021. Correct. That was the day after the 9mm was purchased. Yes. They purchased two boxes of Patriot Defense 9mm ammunition. Yes. Based on your investigation, you learned that they fired one full box of ammunition, or at least you believe that that occurred? That's correct. You recall that each box was approximately $23.99. Yes. 
that they left with one box of 50 rounds of ammunition. Correct. I'm going to get back to, you compared the, the handgun on the math assignment and also the handgun in the home. I'm going to get back to that in just a minute, but I do want to talk about um, keeping a handgun safe in a home. Uh, you would agree that there are a variety of ways to keep a handgun safe in home, and I'm going to give you some examples. One would be to store it in a safe. I said it's less one way to, are you saying when you said keeping a firearm safe, what does that mean exactly? Sure. Um, well, just that, keeping it safely stored, keeping it safe in the home. Safe, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to play a game. I'm just trying to, so you're saying like keeping it safe from from access or from a person, like I'm trying to understand. Sure, from safe from others, safe from accidents, safe from accidental discharge, sure. safe from mishandling, safe from, safe from dot, dot, dot. Sure. That, that's one way I think you could keep a firearm uh, securely stored inside of a home. You can store it in a, in a locking gun case. We saw that the cases that were on the table, they had holes where you could put a lock in them. Yes, that's, that's another way. Yes. You could store it in um, the, the small safe. I guess there's a couple different styles of safes. There's the little safe that, that you showed us earlier, and then there's other bigger safes, correct? Yeah, there's a variety of gun safes out there, yes. You could use a cable lock. Yes. You could use a trigger lock, which goes in the, the trigger. Yes. You could store the firearm unloaded. Obviously, an unloaded firearm is not inherently dangerous, correct? I, I don't want to speculate on whether that would be a safe way to secure a firearm, because you don't know I, I, whether knowing all the ins and outs of whether someone else has ammunition or magazines or things like that. I, I, I don't want to, I can't answer that question. Sure. I guess my question is actually a lot more simple. I'm not asking you to speculate on anything. Sure. Um, simply having an unloaded firearm, is an unloaded firearm in itself dangerous? Or does it become dangerous when you put ammunition in it? I would say that the answer to that question really depends on the, the proficiency with firearms of people in the home. Um, if you have ammunition stored separately and it's just the firearm by itself, if someone clearly knows how to load a magazine and insert it, it's no longer stored safely secured, I would think. My question is a little bit different, though. It's not necessarily talking about, and we can get to the other sure. stuff too. I'm not asking you to avoid that. I'm just part. trying to. I'm really just trying to answer your question. I'm trying to understand what you're trying to ask. Sure. Yeah. What I'm trying to ask is an unloaded firearm, in and of itself, no ammunition in it, no magazine in it, is that itself unsafe? Again, I don't know what else. Being not knowing what else is in the home, I can't answer that question. You would agree that keeping a handgun safe depends on a variety of circumstances. And you talked about some of those, not knowing if there's ammunition in the home, right? Yes, yeah, so are you talking now again about the same line of about it being stored just by itself? Correct. I mean, yeah, there are so many factors that would go into whether that would be a secure way to store a firearm, yes. Where it's stored could also, um, could also be dependent upon the age of the people in the home. I think that's one relevant factor, yes. The home, the people who live in the home, their knowledge of firearms. And I think you mentioned proficiency, like whether or not somebody could load a magazine. Right. I, 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 I think we're getting into an area that's kind of, uh, I, I don't know that, how to answer that question. I'm just really trying to try my best here. I don't know how to answer that question. There's just too many variables. Yes. There are a number of variables that, that come into play when considering how to store a firearm, yes. One of the ways that we just discussed was a cable lock. Cable locks can be removed in more than one way, correct? It can be removed by using a key and unlocking the cable lock? Yes, that's the, the way to unlock the cable lock, yes. And I think that one of our witnesses previously also testified you can also cut off a cable lock. Yes, I, I'm, I'm aware that there are you know tools you can use to uh, defeat a cable lock, yes. As for the youth handgun safety pamphlet that the prosecutor showed you, um, you're aware of federal law, which that ATF handgun safety pam pamphlet is about federal law, correct? Yes. It's not about Michigan laws. Uh, correct. I believe it references state and local ordinances at one point, but it generally speaking, yes, it references the federal law. Okay. And you're aware that it is legal under federal law for a minor to possess a handgun in certain circumstances? Yes, that's correct. That includes going to a shooting range? So it's... We have to be careful about how we're uh, 
describe using the words in that in that sentence. So there's certain specified five specified things in particular about what minors can do alone with firearms with written consent from their parents. It would be hunting, uh, ranching, employment, target practice, and, and hunting, I believe. Um, but there's spe specific things you have to do with as far as if they're doing it alone with written consent, the consent has to be on them. There's a variety of things in the actual statute itself. I can't recall all of them off my head, but but if, if I'd have to love a little more information to know that was okay. Sure. And we don't have any evidence, and you haven't, we haven't looked at any evidence during your testimony, and, and you've been sitting in court for all the witnesses, correct? That's correct. Yeah. There's been no evidence presented by Mr. Wagrowski or any other witness to show that Mr. Crumbly's son went to the range by himself. No, not that I've discovered in okay. this case, no. So you, we're talking about going to a shooting range with a parent. That, that itself is not illegal under federal law. No. Learning firearm safety. Uh, um, a minor can handle a firearm while learning firearm safety. Again, assuming they're with a parent. Right. There's only certain uh, things that are covered by federal law that are even, that federal law even touches upon, and it's the transfer of a handgun to a minor. It's it's not talking. It's not even contemplating those scenarios or discussing. So there is not a federal law that says a parent can't show their fi their child firearm safety. No. And during your involvement in this case. You found no evidence that James Crumbly was aware that his son had obtained unsupervised access to any of the firearms in his house. Can you repeat the question? Yes. During your involvement in this case, you found no evidence that James Crumbly was aware that his son had obtained access to the firearms in his home. I don't recall him ever having the videos of his son playing with the firearm or anything like that. Just the fact that he was present during the time. So he was in the home during those times, but you don't have evidence that James was aware that those activities were occurring. Is that fair? I and I'm not trying to trick you. No, no, I, I haven't. I, I understand your question. If I understand it correctly, you're saying that there's not evidence that, um, you know, he sent a video to his dad saying I was playing with this gun or something to that effect. I never found anything like that. That's what you're asking. You've been involved in this case since November 30th of 2021. We heard your testimony about that. You were involved in the search of Mr. Crumbly's home? Yes. And that was on November 30th of 2021? Yes. And we talked about there were various uh, BB guns found in the home. That's not illegal, correct? You know, I, I can't even comment. I don't know. I'm sure that I'm sure they are. I don't, I have no idea. No idea. Okay. I mean, under state law, I have no idea what's legal and not with BB guns. There were also two pistols which were located in the gun safe, which you testified about previously. Yes, that's correct. Those, that gun safe with those two handguns were located inside of a, you said a, a TV stand or a dresser of some sort? It was, it was like, I think it was a dresser that had a TV on it and it was like, had like a, a couple of drawers and a sliding thing in the middle. Yeah. So it was located inside of that dresser in a cabinet? Yes. There was also an empty Sig Sauer gun case, which we've seen, found in James's bedroom. That's correct along with an empty box of Patriot Defense 9 millimeter, 9 millimeter ammunition. Yes. Also found in James's bedroom. Yes. You learned that Mr. Crumbly purchased three handguns between June and November of 2021? Yes. We went over those purchases today. Yes. With each purchase, um, you know that Mr. Crumbly signed a trigger lock statement. That's correct. And you reviewed those as part of your involvement in the case? Uh, I, yeah, I reviewed the documents from every purchase, yes. Now, you also know that to, for an FFL dealer to be compliant with federal law, that they also have to provide the ATF use safety handgun notice. Correct. Mr. Crumbly purchasing three handguns between June and November, he would have received three of those pamphlets. I believe that's correct, yes. So we've talked about one, the one that was found in the Sig Sauer case, but you don't know the location of the other two. I do not. And there's no requirement in that pamphlet or anywhere that Mr. Crumbly display that notice anywhere in his home. No. Okay. Federally, fire, federally licensed firearms dealers provide the cable locks to each seller, and typically the cable lock comes with the firearm from the manufacturer. Is that fair? Correct. With new, new firearms, that's generally the case, yes. Used firearms, the cable lock might come from somewhere else. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, either the store will, will have you buy one or sometimes people throw it in for free. It all just depends, yeah. And I think we, uh, Ms. Back testified that the the cable lock that we have was from Sig Sauer, correct? Correct. Cable locks are not, not necessarily specific to each firearm. So 
it's not like a key in a, in a lock, right, which is specific to that lock. Cable locks can be used on other firearms. Yeah, generally speaking, yes. They're, they can be used on uh, multiple uh, makes and models of firearms, yes. So assuming that there isn't an issue with the caliber, uh, a 22 caliber we've, we've determined has a smaller, um, a smaller bore, so it's, it's more narrow than a 9mm, which has a wider bore. Correct. So a cable lock specific to a 9mm may not fit in a 22 caliber, but a 22 caliber cable lock may fit in a 9mm, if that makes sense. It depends how you use it. I mean, if you were going to put it through the magazine well and not the actual barrel, uh, some, you know, it, there's, there's different recommendations on how to use it, but if you were going to put it through the magazine well and lock it, it would fit both. So that Sig Sauer cable lock isn't necessarily designed just for that Sig Sauer. A Caltech cable lock could have been used on a Sig Sauer, correct? Uh, Caltech, to my knowledge, does not make cable locks. They provide trigger locks, but I get your point. Yes, yes. a different, different model could work just as well. Okay. There are also universal cable locks, which we've kind of talked about, which could work on any caliber handgun. Correct. Semi-automatic handgun, yes. Semi-automatic, thank you. Again, Mr. Crumbly, we know received all right, three either cable locks or trigger, lock, trigger locks in connection with the purchases of the handguns. Correct, based on the documentation we have, yes. Right. You found one cable lock in the home. That's correct. The keys were still in the lock. Yes. You did not find the other two. No. Or their keys. Uh, not to my knowledge, no. You don't know where those other two cable locks are. Uh, I believe there would have been a, a, a trigger lock with the Caltech, but it's your point, yes. Okay. You don't know whether Mr. Crumbly had a cable lock on the SIG or not at the time that it was taken by his son. Based well, on your investigation. Uh, I would, and based on statements made that we've heard in court and other things like that, I've never heard mention of a cable lock. Um, I've always heard hidden. Okay. You don't know, though. Is that fair based on your investigation? I know that one wasn't recovered at the school or in the house. Um, so I. I is it a certainty? No, I think it's, it's highly improbable. You said that one was recovered at the school? I said one was not recovered at the school. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't um, hear you. you know, so it would, yeah. I found no evidence that a cable lock was ever installed in that firearm. The prosecutor was asking you about the difference between a 22 caliber round and a 9 millimeter round. And there was something about the size of it, um, the bigger the round, the bigger the hole, things like that. I don't know if I said that today, but I, I know it's yes. Okay. Um, there's no evidence that you've realized that you've learned to show that James bought a gun because he wanted more damage. I think that's what you said, more damage. More damage. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I found any evidence that James decided to purchase that firearm. I, I, if my understanding is right, based on things that the only person ever researched the purchase of the firearm was the shooter. We also heard Ms. Back testify that um, and confirm that when Mr. Crumbly went and purchased the 9mm Sig Sauer, that he had made indications that he had been looking at it for a few days. Do you remember that testimony? Yeah, I remember it was either a few days or quite some time. I'm not sure the, the phrasing, but I remember hearing that testimony, yes. And we know that James Crumbly also has fired a 9mm prior to November 26th of 2021. I believe it was September or October of that year. Yes, I, I recall he had at least fired it uh, then and then maybe in July of that year too. We talked about Exhibit 167, which was the small... knew the combination of that safe? I do not. Specifically, you have no knowledge if his son knew the combination of that safe? I do not know if he knew the combination was 000, zero, zero no. You don't know if James was aware if his son had the combination to that safe. Is that fair? Uh, I, I have found no evidence that he provided the, the, the combination or if his son knew the combination, but uh, you know, based on the fact that we recovered the firearms in the home in the safe and that we have videos of at least there's one, the one video on, was it August 19th and August 20th, the two videos of uh, Mr. Crumbly's son playing with the Caltech. Um, there's also a video, I forget the date, of, of uh, the shooter playing with a Derringer inside the house at one point. So if they were in the safe, um, I don't know if his father was there or not. I can't answer that question for certain whether his son knew the code of that safe. Okay. And you talked about August of 21. That was obviously before November 30th of 2021 when you recovered that safe from the cabinet. Correct. 
you testified with the prosecution that you were, I believe you were, used the word shocked to find the ATF youth handgun pamphlet in the, the six hour gun case, right? Yes. Now, we just talked about the fact that there were at least, we believe at least, two other pamphlets that were provided to Mr. Crumbly. Correct. Correct. There, because we know that because there were two other firearms in the home, and sure. you have no reason to believe that those were not sold in compliance with federal law. Correct. You don't know when or how often Mr. Crumbly reviewed those pamphlets with his son? I do not. Prior to November of 2021? No. In fact, it would be a, an assumption that because it was in the, the Sig Sauer case, that that must mean that, that Mr. Crumbly wasn't reviewing those rules or following the rules with his son. Is that fair? Can you, can you either rephrase or repeat the question? Yes. It would be an assumption about whether or not Mr. Crumbly reviewed those pamphlets with his son just because it was found in the Sig Sauer case. Correct. Yeah, I think that's why I said I was shocked that it was just kind of discarded to the back. Yes. And we also established that there was no requirement that he post that pamphlet anywhere in his home. Correct. The prosecutor asked you about registering handguns. Um, you don't know whether James mailed the the pistol sales records, correct? Uh, you mean mailing them in to? If they were if they were mailed in and processed, they would have shown up in the registry. I've actually ran it between trial or either right before the first trial or this trial, and it still wasn't in there. So um, it'd be odd if all three got lost in the mail. Even assuming that James didn't mail them or drop them off, um, the penalty is a civil infraction, correct? Yes, I was only answering the question that they weren't registered. It's a fine, correct? I'm, I'm not. A, I'm, I don't. I mean, I don't enforce that state law particularly. I generally deal with with other other parts of state law with firearms offenses. Um, so I'm, I'll take your word for it. Well, and I can show you the exhibit if you'd like. The pistol sales record actually lists the penalty at the top. Sure. You talked about uh, Mr. Crumbly's son's stance while at the shooting ranges. And you said that it shows that there's some level of proficiency, that he has some level of proficiency with firearms. You would agree that it's important for people in a home where there are firearms present to be familiar with them. And let me, let me clarify that question a little bit. Sure. Obviously, if you have a two-year-old in a home, you are not going to familiarize your two-year-old with a firearm. Is that fair? Sure. Not intentionally. Correct. If you have a teenager in the home or other adults in the home, they should be familiar with the firearms if they're going to be in the home. Is that fair? I think that's obviously a personal decision that I, it's not something covered by federal law that you're required to do that. I think some people may choose to, to not do that and just keep them away from their kids and out of view. But, you know, like I said, that's not something I can speak to. Prosecutor specifically asked you about Exhibit 169, which was the firearm purchase on June 15th of 2021, and that there was a delay. Um, you testified that sometimes the background may take time. That's not a negative or a positive, it's just a fact that it's sometimes they take time. Correct. You heard voices, if you recall, in Exhibits 172 and 173, at the outdoor range, um, which was where the videos on Mr. Crumbly's cell phone of his son firing. Remember those videos? Is that the, the June videos? June 20th? Yes, June 20th, yes. Yes. And you recall um, that there were other voices. Do you recall hearing other voices? I, I don't recall hearing them. I, I don't disbelieve you. Do you recall hearing other, other firearms being fired? I don't know what they were, but you can hear other firearms being fired. I don't. I don't recall after watching it right now. This time, I, I was focused on the on the shooter in this instance. Um, I, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that other people may be shooting at a range as well. Exhibit one seventy five um, is the Instagram post by James Crumbly's wife that both sh uh, Mr. Crumbly and his son quote both got handguns. That was the Instagram story. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And that was uh, that video is showing Mr. Crumbly's son firing the Keltec. Yes. Which was in the safe in his room, in the safe in Mr. Crumbly's room. On November 30th, yes. Correct. Yep. Exhibits 
70 and 71 are the August 19th of 2021 um, video and text that we just talked about a few minutes ago. You, that is of the Caltech, correct? Yes, both of the August 19th and 20th videos were of the Caltech, yes. So you would agree that these may have been the same night. The August 19th video was nine, about approximately 9.30 p.m. and the second video was about 12.30 a.m. the following morning. Correct, yeah, it was the same night into the following morning, yes. Exhibit 70 and 71, you specifically can see that the Caltech is unloaded. In the 819 video? Yes. Yes. That there's no round in the chamber and that the safety is not engaged. Correct. Exhibits 72 and 73 are the August 20th of 21 videos. Your testimony was that Mr. Crumbly's son slammed the firearm down onto the magazine and released the slide forward. Correct, yes. You testified that the way that Mr. Crumbly's son was handling that firearm was not safe handling. Correct. You may have also testified about this, but I wanted to clarify. There was nothing in your investigation that showed that James was aware that his son had made that video. No, again, just only what I testified to, that he was in the home at the time of the video, but uh, no. Exhibit 190 is the September 25th, 2021 um, gun range. There was some uh, nine millimeter rental, some ammunition purchased, and then targets also purchased. Yes. There were silhouette targets and also non-silhouette targets purchased, if you recall. I don't recall, but I, but I take your word for it. There were also range safety officers present, if you recall. Yes, I think that's, that's standard at that, that range, in, in my experience. You described a little bit, discussed a little bit, watching Mr. Crumbly's son, and I don't know if you used the, words mis, the word misfire, but you indicated in your testimony that Mr. Crumbly's son was having an issue with the semi-automatic handgun. Yes. That he was struggling and, and was a, unable to clear something, correct? Yeah, I think he thought a round was in the chamber, and he thought he cleared it, but there was actually nothing in there, and that's when Mr. Crumbly picks up the magazine and inserts it and, and you know, makes it operable again, yes. And obviously we know that Mr. Crumbly and his son went to the shooting range. Yes. And Mr. Crumbly's son handled the handguns. We, wa we watched it. Correct, yes. You would agree that it's important for a person who fires a firearm or a handgun to know how to properly clear a misfire. I wouldn't say that it was a misfire. I would say that, you know, what it appeared to me is that he was, you know, being instructed by his father on how to properly uh, deal with it, any malfunction of the firearm, which is when he racked the slide and then, um, you know, inserted the magazine. So same question, but worded a little bit different. It's important for somebody who fires a, who handles a firearm, or who fires a firearm to know how to deal with things that come up while you're firing it. Is that fair? I would say that, that that's a safe way to, yeah, if you're going to be sh shooting a firearm, that's, that's correct. And if somebody handling a firearm or shooting a firearm doesn't know how to properly do that, it can have potentially very dangerous consequences. Yes. Exhibit 95 is the social media post by Mr. Crumbly's son about um, he, the one where there's the multiple photos of the Sig Sauer. He talks about his new beauty, his 9mm, his Sig Sauer. That. I recall the post, okay. yeah. There was no evidence other than those pictures. Well, let me say this. And I've asked this question before. You've heard it. Based on those photos, you don't know if Mr. Crumbly is standing right outside the frame of the photo. Correct? I do not know. Okay. Um, you've learned nothing. On the day he purchased the firearm when he took those photos? Yes, November 26th. Correct, correct. There's no evidence that Mr. Crumbly gave his son that Sig Sauer and that he had it unsupervised. Is that fair? Other than on, on November 26th of 2021. So I recall there being another video that Detective Wagrowski uh, testified to that I've also observed. I believe that was later that night um, showing uh, the shooter in possession of that firearm filming down the barrel of it. Um, I don't recall uh, any other videos or photos of that on the, on the devices. And along the same lines as I've asked previously, you learned nothing during your investigation that Mr. Crumbly was aware of that video, the one that you just described later that night on November 26th of 2021. Yeah, like, again, the only thing I, I believe he was also present in the home for that one, um, but that, that's the only thing that I could find, yes. In fact, the six-hour case was found 
In Mr. Crumbly and Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly's bedroom. That's correct. It was on the bed next to the open, next to the box of uh, Patriot Defense Ammunition. Exhibit 97 was a photo taken by, I believe, Jennifer Crumbly of the open Sig Sauer box with the Keltac and the Sig Sauer in the case, correct? Yes. That has the ATF pamphlet and the cable lock. Correct. In looking at the Keltac, there's no magazine in the, in the Keltac. I don't believe so in that picture, no. You testified about the Exhibit 42, which is the cable lock that was found at the Crumbly home. Your testimony was if it was used regularly, the bag would be damaged. That cable lock was provided four days before you found the cable lock in the home, correct? Correct, yeah. But if you tried to take that in and out of there, the way that the, mat, the cable lock expands in that bag, it would tear up the edges of it. Um, so that, there would be more wear and tear on the bag. Exhibit 95 is the receipt on November 27th of 2021 when, when Jennifer Crumbly and her son went to the shooting range. Yes. I think I've already discussed this. There was Patriot Defense 9mm ammunition purchased that day, two boxes. Correct. Based on your investigation and your involvement, that was the first time after that six hour was purchased that ammunition was purchased. From, from records we've located, yes, that's correct. If you recall, and if you don't know the answer to this, please tell me, um, you reviewed a lot. Did you also review any statements made to law enforcement um, or the, the interview from the substation of Mr. Crumbly? Yes. Okay. And if you recall, during that interview, James did not know how much ammunition was purchased that day, November 27th of 21. I recall there being a conversation between uh, him and his wife, and I believe he ends up correcting her saying it was 50 rounds, but I, I don't recall the exact words he used. Okay. They discussed the cost. I believe so, yeah, because he was, he was, I think she initially thought there was like 200 rounds, and I think he eventually informed her it was 50 rounds. Okay. Exhibit 196 is the video of Mr. Crumbly's son and Mr. Crumbly's wife at the range. You can see when Mr. Crumbly's son is actually in the booth um, handling the handgun, the 9mm handgun, the Sig Sauer, that there's actually a range safety officer standing slightly behind him to the right. He's got like a bright yellow vest on, correct? Yes. And if you know, and I assume that you do know, the pur purchase purpose of a range safety officer is to ensure that people are handling their firearms correctly. Yeah, I would say it's in compliance with whatever the rules are for that specific range, yes. So if that, we would assume, and if you don't want to assume that's okay, but if that range safety officer had seen Mr. Crumbly's son doing something incorrect or inappropriate, it would have been raised as an issue that day. I would, I would assume so, that's his job, so yes. The box, the empty box of ammunition that was discovered in the Crumbly home on November 30th of 2021 was Patriot, Patriot Defense Ammunition. Yes. And I think you testified earlier that there are um, nine millimeter ammunition is more is more expensive than 22 caliber ammunition, correct? Generally speaking, okay. yes. Okay. But there are, within that, there are, are varying levels of expensive for the nine millimeter ammunition, correct? Correct. And we know that there were two different prices on two different purchases of 9mm ammunition in 2021 by James Crumbly and by his wife Jennifer Crumbly. Yes. And obviously if you're going to the shooting range, you need ammunition to shoot, correct? Yes. So it's not unheard of for somebody to buy rounds of ammunition at a shooting range? No. During your involvement in this case, you saw no information that James Crumbly was aware clarify because I think there were a couple. The Instagram post where his son commented it was exhibit 100 about his quote new SIG. I don't recall if he saw that one. I know he saw uh, the social media post by his wife of the fire, but I, I, don't, I don't believe that there was evidence of the uh, uh, viewing that specific post that I found. You also talked, lastly, you talked about the similarities between the drawing of the handgun on the math that we've seen, the math assignment that we've seen in Exhibit 130, and also, and let me see if I can get back to it, and also um, the similarity to the handgun, the Sig Sauer handgun. Do you remember making that comparison? Yes. Okay. Let me see if I can pull that up. Any person that's turned on TV, guys? 
That's fine. Can you see? Okay. Yes. So you talked about the similarities were the striations on the back of the slide. Yes, that, correct? Was, that was one of them, yes. The location of the ejection port. Yes. The shape of the trigger guard. Yes. And for those reasons, you believe that that was the same as the six-hour handgun. Uh, and also the, the, the shape of the floor plate of the magazine. When, you, when all those are combined, each one taken in isolation, not the case. But if you put them all together, then yes. And you obviously work for the ATF. Yes. You have some significant familiarity with handguns. Yes. This is the Sig Sauer handgun. It's Exhibit 86. This is the I'm sorry, the Smith and Wesson handgun. A photo that was sent to James Crumbly by his son um, prior to the purchase of the Sig Sauer handgun. Correct. Um, there's striations on the back. Correct. Um, not on the front. Uh, there's striations on the back. There are striations on the back, but not the front of that firearm. And there's that's the ejection port that we can see on the top. Well, the, the side facing us. Obviously, you can't see what's on the other side. Correct. There's also a black line that's not, you know, it's a, a two-tone firearm and there's a black line. There's, there's vast differences between that one and the one that's drawn. There are some similarities like we discussed, like, but I said again, taken in isolation, it could be a different firearm, but when all put together, it appears to be the same firearm. And you don't know if anyone who viewed that handgun on the math homework even made the connection between that and the six hour. Is that fair? Other than you. We know you did. I found I found no evidence that they did it. You know, I, I know that if you if you buy a firearm, you know, you generally know what it looks like. But you know, I know for the question, Jeremy. Briefly, <clears throat> Special Agent Brandon, um, Defense Counsel just asked you some questions about um, other cable locks being used or could have been used. Do you remember that? Yes. All right, and she asked you about the other two cable locks. Um, do we have any evidence there were there were two other cable locks ever given to James Crumbly? No, there were two trigger lock forms that could have been trigger locks or cable locks. Um, uh, and honestly, the, the, the cable lock for the Derringer probably wouldn't even work uh, because you have to have one small enough to fit through the, you know, the actual firearm itself, which the same one would not. All right, and you just testified that you believe a trigger lock was what was sold with the Caltech. Did you say that? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, did you find any evidence of the, the a, a trigger lock or another cable lock anywhere in the home? No. Anywhere in the school? Uh, I, I didn't search the, the school, but I'm not aware that one was ever located. Okay. Um, she just asked you about the, subs, the comments at the substation. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. What did James Crumbly say when he was asked where that weapon was? I believe he said it was in the armoire, hidden in the armoire, and then he said the, the ammunition was um, underneath a pair of jeans. Did he ever say locked? No. Was there anything that struck you about his, um, his mention of the SIG? Yes, so when he mentions the SIG Sour, he mispronounced sour as Sawyer, which if you purchased that firearm and it was for yourself, you'd be familiar with how to say six sour. Okay. And Your Honor, I, I would I would object to that response and ask for it to be stricken. He's making an assumption about what Mr. Yeah, Crumley yeah. knows. System. System. I'll move on. Uh, Special Agent, last question. You mentioned earlier that you reviewed the the cell phone data um, and web searches of that were on the um, the phone of James Crumley. Yes. All right. And did you ever find any searches that he did relating to firearm safety or minors? Uh, it was, I, I did, there were searches related to that topic. It was after the shooting had occurred. Okay, so December something, after the shooting occurred. Yes, I don't recall the exact date, but it was after the shooting. Anything before? Uh, regarding firearm safety, not that I recall. Thank you, nothing further. May this witness be excused, Your Honor? Yes, you could, you could step down when you're excused. Thank you, Your Honor. You don't have someone brief for today. Not 15 minutes brief, Judge. We have somebody here, but we wouldn't get through my direct, that's for sure. All right, so 9 o'clock tomorrow? Yes, sir. Thank okay. you, Judge. I need to tell you, ladies and gentlemen.